Okay. I have too many screens open at once.
Great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our second annual Virtual Brain Injury Awareness Day. Once again, we're not able to be on Capitol Hill. Um, so we are here gathering virtually um, to celebrate Brain Injury Awareness Day. And we have uh, almost 30 speakers here today uh, throughout the day that will be sharing their story, either as a brain injury survivor, caregiver, or a professional. Uh, so I'm really excited for today's lineup. Uh, we have a really great group of people here for you today. And as we go throughout today, um, we have have the chat room open or you can comment if you're watching through Facebook, you, you can comment on Facebook post and we'll be monitoring those um, as we go throughout the day as well. If you have any questions or comments or anything that you would like to share and I'm just take a moment to introduce you all to Andy. Andy, do you mind hopping on here for a moment? Um, Andy is my assistant for the day. So those of you here on Zoom, you will see him um, popping you in and out of the panelists and the attendees. If you are, um, if you come in as a panelist, but you're not speaking for a while, he will put you into the attendee section. Uh, Andy, we have to spotlight you. There we go. Um, so here's Andy. Andy Hello, will be everyone. throughout the day, um, and he will kind of be helping me with the controls and the background and making sure everything keeps going. Um, so thank you, Andy, for being here. I appreciate it. Um, you can go hide now if you like. <laughs> um, all right. So Andy's here. Like I said, he will be helping control things on the back end. If any of you panelists have um an important question, you can message him directly through the, the chat box, um, or you also should have his email if you're having any sort of weird issue with your Zoom. All right, so welcome everyone. I'm just going to give people a few minutes to hop on. I know it's just a couple minutes after 10, um, so we're just going to kind of vamp here for a little bit. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm just checking in with who's here today. I see, welcome Amy, Cheryl. Hi Cheryl, Elise, Frank. Oh, hey Frank, my favorite New Jerseyan or is it New Yorkian? I think you're New Jersey. Sorry if I mix that up, Frank. Uh, we got Jamie here, Karen, Kathy, Leroy, Linda, a couple Lindas. Lisa, Lynn, Marsha, Mary, Peter, Susan, Taryn, Tiffany. Welcome everyone. We got Abby, Joan, and Patty. Welcome. Ah, Frank, Philly. I was so close. I knew it was somewhere over there. I live in Philly, but I'm from New York. All right. Well, welcome, Frank. And Sharon, thank you for the happy birthday message. Yes, today is my birthday. That's why I picked today. So uh, no one um, can say that I picked today when they want it, the date for something because it's my birthday. So you can't argue with that. All right. So welcome, everyone. I'm just going to hop to Facebook, see who we got going here. If you're on Facebook, there's a bunch of you on Facebook. So go ahead and drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Same if you're here on Zoom, drop a comment. Let us know where you're from. Um, I love seeing how far of a reach we have um, through the internet and through being able to do these virtually. And you know, while it's really great to gather in Washington, DC and be there in person, you know, I know not everybody can make the trip. So having a virtual event, I think is more accessible and can bring more people together. So thank you all for being here. Looks like Facebook, we got John. Hi, John. Hi, Bevy, Beverly, Michelle, couple of Michelles, lots of Michelles. 
Welcome everyone. John's from Connecticut. We got Vermont, Northern Maine. Welcome everyone. And I'll look here. We got Ontario, Canada, Raleigh, North Carolina, Guffey, Colorado, Jessica's here, Dallas, Fort Worth, New Jersey, California, Boston, Austin, Texas, Massachusetts, South Carolina, Colorado. Awesome. Got, we're kind of representing everywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed we've got someone from California already because I know it's early for you guys. It's about eight o'clock there. So welcome everyone. All right. Well, I think we can start jumping into some content. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. All right. Oh, come on. There we go. Andy, if I'm not good, I assume you'll you'll tell me. All right. So as you all know, March is Brain Injury Awareness Month. And traditionally, um, about this time of the month, we head out to Washington, D.C. Um, to meet with our representatives, our senators and Congress people, um, and try and get them to join the Congressional Brain Injury Task Force. And um, last year, or sorry, it would have been 2020, um, that was our last time in Washington, D.C. And I had the pleasure of meeting with my Congresswoman, Angie Craig, um, literally days before Washington, D.C. shut down. And we had a wonderful conversation about affordable health care. And she was really interested in learning more about brain injury and how um, my being on Medicaid had allowed me to get some treatment that I needed um, for my brain injury. Um, and I was supposed to take part in, she had invited me to take part in a media panel um, in like two weeks after I was out there. And unfortunately the world began to shut down. So that, um, that panel never happened, um, but I'm hopeful that maybe that will take back up here in the future. Um, but Andy is on the back end and he's going to be dropping some of these links into the chat room for you guys. You guys are always also welcome to take a screenshot um, so that you can come back to these links as well. Um, but BIAUSA.org is the Brain Injury Association of America and the USBIA.org is the United States Brain Injury Alliance. So depending on what state you live in, you either have an alliance or an association. And there's a couple of states that have both. Um, I believe New York is one of them. Um, but most states have one. Um, I'm in Minnesota and we have an alliance, which I'm very actively involved with. Um, we have a citizens advocate group, um, which meets every Tuesday at the Capitol while, <clears throat> excuse me, while our legislation is in session. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we're still not back fully in person yet. So we are still doing virtual meetings. Um, but I did have a meeting with my Senator Carla Bigham and my representative, Tony Jurgens. Um, I had a virtual meeting with them and I asked them to help support some of the bills that Minnesota is trying to put forth this year, including um, Cassie's law, which would require neuro neuropsychological testing um, for anyone um, basically for anyone who's being imprisoned. Um, so Cassie was disabled. She was in a wheelchair. She had a brain injury and she was at a, um, I guess maybe like a mediation and they had left the door open and, you know, she has a brain injury. So she just wheeled out the door. She's like, Oh, cool. I want to get some fresh air. Well, they considered her <laughs> that she fled. And so they added more time to her sentence. And, you know, the reality was she wasn't fleeing. She just didn't understand um, that she wasn't supposed to leave the room. And so they're um, 
trying to require neuro neuropsychological testing to help um, tease out people who have brain injuries. And as you know, many people that are incarcerated do have a brain injury. Um, so just trying to bring some more attention to that. And we're also trying to decrease our Medicare spend down um, from, I believe right now they have to spend down to like 850. And they're trying to bring that up to at least a thousand um, to try and keep some extra money in your pocket for those that are on SSDI and Medicare. And there's a couple other bills that are going through and I just can't remember them off the top of my head, but whatever state you are in, try and connect with your alliance or your association and get involved. Um, many states have similar programs. And um, you know, if you enjoy doing some lobbying and advocating, um, it can be a really good fit for you. All right, so many of you have already purchased your Not Invisible Care package. Um, it's just $5 plus $1 shipping and handling. Um, unfortunately, you know, I can only ship in the US. It gets really ridiculously expensive to ship out of, out of the country. So I apologize to our Canadian friends, but um, this is just for the US, but uh, you can get this fun little care package it has a sticker, a button, some wristbands. Um, so go ahead and uh, check out that link if you're interested in the care package. Uh, as always, I have tons of resources on my website at facesoftbi.com. You can look through, I have hundreds of blog posts that you can read through, um, but I have a lot of tabs for you um, for um, just lots of resources. We have lots of little YouTube videos, uh, TBI TV, we have the podcast. And then of course, Amy's TBI tribe. I believe many of you are already in my Facebook group. We have over 10,000 members in our group. Um, but this is just a, a, a nice safe place to gather and share information and just, you know, make friends with other TBI survivors and caregivers and loved ones. So I invite you all to join Amy's TBI tribe if you're not already there. And my podcast, Faces of TBI, you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever it is you listen to podcasts, Spotify, um, you can subscribe directly there, or you can go right to my website um, to listen to the podcast as well and listen to previous podcasts. Um, we're up to almost like 225 episodes. So there's a ton of back episodes that you can go listen through um, and you can just kind of scroll through and find any topics that might be of interest to you. We've had a ton of great professionals on um, sharing how they work with TBI survivors and lots of survivors as well on sharing their journeys. And you can also find the doctor guide on my website. Um, I get asked all the time, you know, how I found a doctor to help me, how someone can find a doctor. Um, as many of you know my story, uh, I found functional neurology and that was what finally helped me get better. It wasn't traditional health, the traditional healthcare system. Um, and so if you fill out a simple Google form with with some information, um, Dr. Shane Stedman or Perry Maynard from Integrated Brain Centers will reach out to you and schedule a free consultation with you um, to try to help you find a good fit. Um, if you're up to traveling to Colorado, um, they would be more than happy to see you at their clinic or they will help try and find a clinic closer to you, um, which unfortunately there aren't enough functional neurologists out there. Um, so you might not have one close to you depending where you live. Um, but I can't stress enough how helpful functional neurology was in my recovery. And my accessible yoga classes, you guys, I have monthly yoga classes on Zoom or weekly, I should say. Um, Mondays and Thursdays, it's just $10 a month and you can take as many classes online as you like. And the replays are also available in a private Facebook group. Um, so you have tons of um, past uh, videos to watch as well. 
Um, and it's just $10 a month on Patreon. Um, so you can go ahead and check that out if you're interested in taking some accessible yoga with me. We'll do a little bit of yoga later in the day. So stay tuned for that. And of course, the Brain Health Magazine, you guys, this is like a fantastic resource for you guys. There's absolutely nothing out there like it. So I created it. Um, you can get a free digital subscription to download each month, or sorry, every other month, or you can get a print subscription in the US and that's $25 if you would like it printed and delivered to your mailbox. And of course, I have a couple books out there sharing my journey. And both of my books are available on Amazon. You can check those out. You can just search my name on Amazon. And we're giving away a free book, you guys. We're giving away Concussion Discussions, which is an anthology of over 20 doctors participated in this book. It came out last March. You might remember um, if you were part of the event last year. And we are giving this away for free, just covering shipping and handling, which still comes out to be half the price of what you would pay on Amazon. So go ahead and check out that link if you would like to grab your copy. We only have 50 available and I think about eight have already been taken. So go ahead and do that quickly if you're interested. And you can follow me on Instagram. I post pretty much every day. I post some inspirational quotes, um, but you can just follow me on Instagram and I will follow you back as well. And then I just have to give a big shout out to our sponsors for today. Our major sponsor is Integrated Brain Centers. As I already mentioned, they're in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Shane Studman and Perry Maynard, they specialize in treating individuals with brain injury and concussion. And our other sponsors who you will hear from throughout the day, Hope After Brain Injury, Mindful Dina Joy, Lighthouse, Self-Care Sanctuary, Inspired Evolution, Broken Wings, Green Compass, Brooke Mills, National Concussion Awareness Day, Allo Holistic Wellness, and Simone Fortier. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, I think. There we go. All right. So Andy, if you want to queue up, we have a commercial from our sponsor integrated brain centers and then we have a lovely welcome video from congresswoman angie craig so i will let you go ahead andy and play those no sound andy <laughs> there's always one glitch in every event <laughs> You might have to unmute. For those who have suffered. There we go. Hey everybody, Dr. Shane Stedman here with Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. We specialize in brain-based rehabilitation for those who have suffered from a concussion or traumatic brain injury. What sets us apart from other clinics is that we combine the aspects of functional medicine and functional neurology to come up with an individualized, customized treatment plan for those who have suffered from a traumatic brain injury. If you or someone you know has suffered from a TBI, let them know that we can help. We offer a free 30-minute consultation to find out whether or not we would be a good fit for you. You can either go to our website at integratedbraincenters.com or you can call 303-781 5617 and schedule your free consultation now to find out if we would be a great fit. And then Andy's going to queue up our welcome video from Congresswoman Angie Craig. Hi everyone, it's Congresswoman Angie Craig here from Minnesota's second congressional district. It's such an honor to join you here for this virtual uh, brain injury awareness day. I came to Congress to help everyone, including folks who've suffered TBIs, to get good, affordable access to health care. So thank you again for what every single one of you do to advocate for TBI. You have a friend in Congress in Minnesota, too. 
Awesome. All right. And now we can kick off our brain injury awareness day event. We have a commercial hope after brain injury to show you, and then we will have our first speaker. So Andy, go ahead and cue up our commercial. Thank you, Amy, for all that you're doing for brain injury survivors and, and their caregivers. I'm Dr. Dina Adams, president and founder of Hope After Brain Injury. You guys feel free to come to our website, hopeafterbraininjury.org. You'll notice that we have a monthly support group, an annual conference, and we have loads of information for you. Hope Lessons, uh, One Minute of Hope, podcast, just put Hope After Brain Injury and you will find us. Have a great conference. All right. So our first speaker, you can pull her in here with me, um, is Patty Foster. And Patty is from Arlington, Texas. And I have known Patty now for several years. Um, I'm trying to think, I think we met for the first time when I spoke at the conference in Texas. I think that's mm -hmm. the first time we met and um, I've had the pleasure of meeting you several times along the way and I've had you on my podcast and I'm so thrilled to have you here. So Patty, I am going to let you have your moment here. Thank you. You did an awesome job. Cheers to you, Miss Birthday Girl, for great work 24-7 for however long you and Andy have really worked to coordinate this day. So cheers in the chat room to you. Okay, well, thanks to everyone for being here. We are a family because we need each other. And I am Patty Foster. I was dead at the scene. White sheet pulled over me, parts of me hanging out. So it shows miracles do happen. Okay, for this first part of our not invisible Brain Injury Awareness Day. I'm really going to highlight hope and purpose after brain injury. I've entitled my segment simply this, Discovering Hope and Purpose After Brain Injury. A few years ago, I came up with the acrostic of purpose. Okay, now I'm going to pass along these letters to you. You see how they connect to you and then write your own. Okay, here's purpose, P. Pay attention to what connects to your heartbeat. You utilize every opportunity or refuse to give up. Sure, it's fine to press pause, but please don't throw in the towel, don't stop. P, pray, and when you think you've done enough, pray some more. O, offer help to someone else. S, season your life with serendipities. You know, those unexpected blessings on a great birthday like Amy is beginning today. And then E, encourage yourself and others to soak in and gain more learning, practice discipline, and remember to search for your purpose after brain injury. Some of the lingering deficits that I deal with because like you know, I mean, can I get a witness that when it comes to brain injury, seeing is not always believing. Some of the lingering deficits I deal with are balance and equilibrium, you know, like curbs or stairs, especially going down the stairs. Short-term memory loss, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. Fatigue, I can push myself, keep going, just like Amy and Andy have done throughout this whole process of getting this day ready. Agitation for me now, agitation is, is very, it's quick. You don't see it coming. Uh, also self-doubt, you know, second guessing yourself because once the brain has been damaged, it's difficult to really trust your brain again. Also double vision, blurred vision, you know, when uh, sick or fatigued. Also easily distracted short-term attention span. I want to highlight this quote. Some of you may be familiar with it by Helen Keller. She discovered throughout, throughout her incredible life this about character. Okay, listen to this. Take a Calgon moment in this. Soak in this a while, eh? 
character is not developed in quiet and ease, only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, envision cleared, ambition inspired, and success revealed. Hmm, good words to think about. I remember as I was waking from my coma, Dr. Chalk, my neuropsych at Baylor in downtown Dallas, he would often remind me and my family, take your time. America, that is against America. America is instantaneous. Oh, dear. Uh, also, if you're dealing with coma or, you know, one of your friends may be waking from a coma or becoming conscious. These are things that help me. Let me pass these along because they can help to reinstate that hope. Uh, enlarge pictures and put them on a wall where the patient's eyes can see them. Point to people in the pictures and say their names, you know, loudly, clearly, slowly, like the patient knows what you're saying. And this will help them relearn these significant people's names. Place a journal on a stand outside of the patient's room so guests can sign, write notes or prayers for the patient when the patient is not able to have visitors. Give permission to someone to take pictures of the patient's journey or the healing process or the recovery stages so that they're able to see them in time down the road when they're ready and have questions. Also, keep a journal as a survivor, as a caregiver, as a friend, maybe a health prof professional. Make details clear. Remember to include dates and maybe times of days or night. Details help immensely. Can I get a witness, please, y'all? Uh, play the patient's favorite music. You know, their preferred kind of music. And, and put it in a device near their head so it plays 24-7 because we know the power of music. You know, and I think since the crash, am I waking up, even though I was in TV and media all my life, I think since the crash, like sound effects, even more alive to me these days. <laughs> All right, as I move right along, uh, also find out where their strengths were, you know, before the crash, before the issue, before the wreck, and then try to make some adjustments that might help them now. Ask for some of their deep learning moments or life lessons, or things they're gaining, and then give them opportunity to pass these along, share these, you know, like Amy does on her podcast. Uh, also remember that most most of us TBI survivors have our best time in the morning. Uh, also, let me just pass along, let's go toward communication for a few minutes. Remember these two numbers, 793. Some 7% of communication, vastly 7 to 10% of communication, is verbal. The nouns, pronouns, adverbs, you know, 25 cent words, make up that communication verbal. The majority, the vast majority, 93% is nonverbal. Your tone of voice, your touch, facial expressions, body gestures, eyes, tone of speech, speed of speech. Um, so I pass along to you my question of a lifetime that came to me a few years after I began waking from the coma and the crash and everything. Simply this, if I never see you again, take this with you. What does your life say? when your mouth is not moving, your choice. Also, have a go at discovering your motto for a living. Mine came to me a few years after the crash, M-A-D now. Make a difference now, because we never know how much time we have remaining, nor do we know the quality of that time. So while we have this moment, may we lay hold of the moment, lean, into the moment and live that moment. And you know that moment on purpose. Okay, I wrap up with this wonderful poem. You guys may know this, Outside Insight. Jan, TBI survivor, put this together some 15 years ago. On the outside, you see me as normal. On the inside, I see how non-normal I am. On the outside, I appear involved in the discussion. 
on the inside. I see how furiously my brain is working just to keep up. On the outside, you see me forget things. On the inside, I am infuriated by my forgetfulness. On the outside, my words seem to come easily. On the inside, I can feel the words slipping away from my lips. On the outside, you see me laughing at jokes. On the inside, I don't get it. I feel stupid. On the outside, you see me as normal. On the inside, I see my brain injury. And it hurts. Persevere through each difficulty. Sure, press pause, but please don't give up. Search, find, and live your purpose and be the hope. I'd love to hear from you if you want to shoot me an email, pattyfoster.com or info, I-N-F-O at pattyfoster.com, P-A-T-T-I-F-O-S-T-E-R.com. Cheers to you, sweet Amy, and to our whole, whole family today. Patty, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. You get a gold star for being exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> and Patty, oh. I loved how you mentioned the 793. Um, hmm. Because I think for so many of us, that loss of um, reading verbal cues um that was really challenging for me and i couldn't figure out for a long time why talking on the phone just completely drained me and then i realized it's because there weren't any verbal cues with it and mm -hmm. so i asked everyone to start facetiming or zooming with me because yes. it was so much easier to communicate <laughs> so if that's Cute. helpful for one person out there today <laughs> we've done Definitely. our job <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you, great. Patty, so much for being great. here. Thank you. Always thank you. a pleasure. Cheers. Awesome. Loved it. Thanks so much. Wonderful. And all right. So our next speaker is Joan Lang. So Andy, you can bring her in here. There we go. Hi, Joan. Hi. Joan Happy birthday, is... birthday girl. This is thank exciting. You. Thank Yay. you. Yay. <laughs> So I Joan is from Marblehead, Massachusetts, and is a brain injury survivor. All right, I'm going to let you take it over here, Joan. I'm just so grateful for uh, everything that's occurred, even with COVID, because we've all been able to connect so much more virtually, and I've been able to connect with you, Amy, and you're just an amazing person. And Patty, that's just a wonderful uh, connection, too, because I've, um, I had a similar situation where I, in my brain injury, uh, they, they, people who saw it was, were amazed that I was even alive, that I even survived. I had a whole near death experience. I, I felt my life leaving my body. I could see myself from above. Uh, I was leaving and, and then I, uh, it was really beautiful. And I felt the connectedness of all humanity, all the souls connected, but I, I knew it wasn't my time. And then I came back and I'm so grateful to be back and be here and I knew that I one of my missions was to help people and it's really made me so grateful I've always been uh grateful and optimist but it's really uh honed that um to this other level and um I'm a world-renowned poet and I'm I speak uh, motivational speaking and I do personal coaching with trauma and I just want to help as many people as I can because we are all connected exactly as Patty said we're all one we're a community and especially with the brain injury it's just so difficult because we it, it's invisible and it's, it's very frustrating when the doctors can't help us and when our friends and family think that they understand when they have no idea what we're going through with our actual tool for navigating life has been damaged and it's and no one can see it they think that we're just as we were and we know that we're not and it's frustrating and I know that with COVID I had a full body spasm because it feels like everything with COVID is like compressed everything and I I, I realized that I've had my brain injury for 20 years I I was unable to speak for a long time. I couldn't move my arms and legs. I couldn't do a lot of things. I was in excruciating pain for 10 years. It felt like I was being filleted open every day. It was really horrible. And one of the things that's gotten me through it is um, seeing how we're all connected and trusting that and, and also finding my own beauty within myself. 
and exploring the beauty in the universe. And, and we just have so much to share with each other and also finding uh, ourselves as a new canvas. That's what I feel like. My, I've worked on a program I'm working on moving from why to wow, because it's all, we can get stuck in the, why did this happen to me? Why is this occurring? And then I feel like we, if we move to wow, like who is this new person? And you have an opportunity to see yourself differently and explore yourself differently. No one gets a chance to really stop and just explore who they are. And so I know even though it seems difficult and it's awful frustrating, and I really, I felt like when I had the full body spasm, I realized I was still angry. I was still mad that it had happened. And so instead I've learned to accept it and make it a joy. So I took my physical therapy papers and I put them in a beautiful turquoise frame, my favorite colors you can see behind me. And I've been going in that route. And so I wanna share a few of the things that have helped me. If you, um, I have a website called Poetic Gazette. Dot com. I'm also on Instagram, Poetic Gazette, and um, Amy has my email. I believe it's in the contact sheet, joan.lang at icloud.com, but I'd love you to join me. Uh, I have Motivational Mondays. I have programs, and I have all kinds of things that have helped me. I have a pain cream that has just been the only thing that's helped me in 20 years, and Patty was talking about support. I have these wonderful support souls that have helped me with my balance that are used by the Olympians. So they're really incredible. And I'm just trying to help as many people as I can um, because we are all one connected community. So one of the things I first do each day is I sort of do a full body check-in. So if you wanna join me, you can just press your hand against your head, feel how that feels and press your other side of your head. Just feel the contact. You're present with us. And then just sweep your hand over your head all the way down your spine. Picture a golden river of light, flushing everything you don't need down to the earth and letting the earth support you. And then just, you can either do it one at a time, but press the outside of your arms and the inside of your arms. Just feel how it feels. You're here and then you go on to the waist, put your hands on either side of your waist. You can do it standing or sitting. Then you go on down to your hips, press your hands against your hips and just feel yourself here. And then press the outside of your thighs. And the inside, just press in the opposite direction of your hands. And then press your calves, the outside of your calves, the inside of your calves. And then if you'd like, you can cross your legs and press your feet or just do what I do is I press my feet into the ground and just feel Mother Earth supporting me. And then I visualize myself as a mountain. So if you'd like to join me, you can close your eyes or you can just share it with me. Picture yourself as your favorite mountain. I'm sure they have some beautiful mountains in Minnesota. <laughs> and um, you just picture yourself. It's springtime and everything's beginning and there's new little green buds on the trees and the flowers are just peeking through and the birds are making their nests. And then you go on to summer and picture your mountain covered in beautiful green grass, lush grass, and the flowers are in full bloom, all the different colors, picture the flowers, picture your favorite flowers. And the newly born birds have flown their nests and then you go on to, some, to fall from summer and it's, the wind is crisper and the river in front of you is glistening and the trees on your mountain are in all different colors and the flowers have returned their nutrients to the soil. And then you go into winter and there's snow, beautiful white snow covering your mountain and the river in front of you has frozen and people are ice skating and everything is at rest. And we move from that to what I'm working on right now is in the Moving from Why to Wow program, because I really feel like this is an opportunity to reshape our lives and really have a chance to pause, and see who we really are and love ourselves, is that I'm writing a global poem. And so each week we're doing a different series. I'm moving my way through the alphabet because I'm, as a poet, I believe that words have power and that um, we, each word gives us strength. So this week's letter is A and I invite you to just sort of shape the A like the mountain that we are on. 
We are a mountain, we are strong, I am amazing. I am aware that I'm amazing. And then picture your legs, the bottom of the A, very strong on the earth. And then an A has a little crossbar in the middle, right? So bring your hand across the center and put your hands on your hips. I am amazing. I love this, it's like the superhero pose. I am aware that I'm amazing. Bring your awareness to yourself. And I invite you to share your words that make you feel amazing. I will put them together in a book and we will make a poem at the end of the year. And all of your words will be out there because once words are spoken, they are never gone. We are always connected. This week's poem, I had some lovely words sent to me. One person, uh, Gail in upstate New York, sent me some words and I'll share it with you. This is a poem I wrote with this week's words. Spring arrives and I am alive. Maybe not where I thought I'd be, but thriving in my own way. Making the most of every day, I adapt. Like every plant and every seed that gathers what it needs, from exactly where it lands. Each day I awake and let the sun bake my soul. I glean what I need from soil and rain, open my petals widely to share what is inside, let the petals rest. I share what is the best in me and close out the light when day is done. Tomorrow, when another morning arrives, I shall be born anew. I may not be as I was before, but I am true to me. And I can see that though my heart is broken, it is wide open too. This I know is true. I invite you to contact me by email and just say hi or share the words that make you feel amazing. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye now. Thank you, Joan. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much for your little grounding exercise as well. And um, yeah, do you want people to just put in the in the chat um, if they have a word for you or email you or all of the above? I just I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to put together in a book, and I know that you're an activist, and I've been an activist my whole life, and I I know that we have. I may have gone over my 10 minutes, but I wanted to share this one last thought. It's, um, it's a song by Carol King. <laughs> I just want to say to wake up every morning with a smile on your face and show the world all the love in your heart. People got to treat you better. They're going to find, yes, you will, that you're beautiful. Yes, you're beautiful as you feel find the beauty within and let's do it together and i'm so proud of what you're doing Amy. Oh, thank you so much joan and go ahead and drop your email in the chat when, when i will on here and um I encourage everyone to send her your a word oh thank you so much joan it's been a pleasure together pleasure all right Okay, our next speaker is Abby Goodwin, and she is joining us from Nova Scotia, Canada. That's so exciting. We're international now. And Abby is a brain injury survivor. So welcome, Abby. Thank you so much. I'm stoked to be here. I'm a bit nervous, but that's okay. You'll do great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, as Amy introduced me a few moments ago, my name is Abby and I live in Nova Scotia, Canada. And yes, it is very cold here right now. Um, I moved out here in the last about three years with my family and uh, I'm 31 years old and I am really excited to speak to you today about a little bit about my TBI story and what has helped me along the way, including um, the power of what we eat. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you have recognized in your own 
bodies, whether you're healing from a brain injury or not, oftentimes the things that we are putting into our bodies affect how we feel. And it was, it was especially when I was recovering when I am, but when I started to recover from my brain injury, that I felt really crappy if I was eating not so great things. And I felt really good if I ate these certain foods. So I was very interested in learning more about how nutrition can support my recovery. And yeah, I want to share that with you today. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. And, um, tell you a little bit about my background. So I have a yoga spirituality background. I've been a yoga teacher for quite some time now, over 10 years, and I've been practicing yoga for quite a while as well. When I was in my early 20s, I would travel to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and I would teach yoga in these um, beautiful, hot, sunny places. And then when I arrived back in Canada, after doing a bit of uh, traveling in Central America, once again, teaching yoga while I was there, um, I started to get really curious about my cooking skills. So I had this group of women who I would teach yoga to multiple times a week. And I kind of thought to myself, I wonder if they'd like my curry. Or I wonder if they'd like my quinoa salad. So what I started doing was bringing little mason jars of this beautiful food I was making to class. And if they wanted some after they were done their shavasana, I'd have it for them. What's better, yoga and dinner made. So that's kind of how my business began, was um, selling these mason jar meals to my fellow yogis in my community. And it was a few months after that uh, business began that my accident happened. So everything was really put to a halt. Everything came to a standstill. And I had to go through a very similar recovery journey and process that I'm sure a lot of you also have gone through. Um, after being in a coma, you wake up, you gotta relearn how to walk, to swallow, all that. I'm sure you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And isn't that cool <laughs> that we all kind of get it? So as I was recovering, it was always, I was always still very interested in what I could be eating to help my brain recover faster, stronger, better. Um, and so I started doing a lot of research on my own. Um, looking up articles, reading the blogs about how I could eat for my, how I could eat to support my brain. Um, it was about, about a year ago, I enrolled in the Academy of Culinary Nutrition, which is an online uh, program out of, based out of Toronto, Ontario. And I received my certification as a culinary nutrition expert. Now, throughout this program, my research was focused towards neurological rehabilitation through nutrition. So every assignment that I did, every recipe that I developed, every recipe I tested, every, every paper I wrote about everything in the program was geared towards eating for cognitive health and eating for um, repairing your brain. And after that program, wow. Now I've got all of these tools, I've got so much more information, and I have a lot of confidence in offering what I know and teaching what I know to my fellow survivors now. So what I've been doing in the, in the Nova Scotia area is I've come up with these little workshops, Neuro, Neuro Nutrition 101, how the foods we eat can heal our brain. And I've been coming up with these little workshops where I teach people what to eat and why it's beneficial to, for their brains to be eating certain foods. I go through how to cook in larger batches because, I mean, as we know, fatigue is a big, 
big hindrance in most of our daily lives. So to pace ourselves is one thing, but then to have food in the fridge or in the freezer that could just be pulled out and you know that you have a great meal that is going to help not only satiate your hunger, but heal your brain. Like there's nothing better than that. So it's my goal and it's, it's my passion to give other survivors these tools and share this information with them so that we can really take our power back as survivors, as human beings, and heal ourselves in this way. Um, when I was going through my recovery process, especially the first about five years, a lot of my energy, a lot of my power was being given away. I would depend on this specialist or that therapist or that doctor to tell me what to do. Just give me the tools, tell me what to do so that I can get better. Like who has the, who has the information? Who, like, where can I get this from? Giving my power away. Oh, maybe this person can help me. Maybe if I get see this specialist, then I'll be able to feel better. And I know a lot of us have been through that. And to an extent, that's necessary. We do need professionals, absolutely. But for me, in learning this information and learning these tools on how to feed my brain, I feel so much better in like taking back some of that power. Yeah, I can do this. I've got these skills now that I can heal myself a lot of the way. When I'm eating these certain foods in a certain way, I, my symptoms are minimized. I sleep better. My fatigue is a lot less. My mood is much more stable. And isn't that great that we can learn these tools and acquire this knowledge and really just become the masters of our own recovery. S take a seat in the driver's seat once again in our lives and do it our way and do it the right way, but our version of the right way. <laughs> so that's what I would love to share with you today about what I've learned and my journey. You can always reach out to me through Instagram. I, um, that's where I'm most active. And my Instagram name is uh, the at symbol Abby's Love Hub. And on there, I'm always sharing great neuronutrition tips. You can contact me um, for support or recipes or anything like that. I love, I, like I said, I'm passionate about sharing this information with fellow survivors so that we can get better and we can have fun doing it and eating delicious food. <laughs> thank you so much for, uh, for listening. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak my truth, Amy. Um, I forgot to put on my timer, so I have no idea how long. You did perfect. You're at nine minutes, girl. Oh, love it. <laughs> love it. <laughs> and so I much. just uh I just want to share you've gotten several messages. Yeah. Um, people just saying thank you and that this touched their heart to put themselves back in the driver's seat. Um and there was another one. Um, I'm getting ready to make a step into employment for nutrition and life coaching. This is so inspiring. And she wants to connect with you. So you can go find that in the chat. And then on Facebook, Taryn said, beautiful mission, Abby. So I just wanted to share this with you. And um, yeah, you, you know, so inspiring, Abby. And I want to come to your yoga class <laughs> with food at the end. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, okay, and we'll start to wake up from Shavasana and here's your dinner. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you so much, Abby, for being here today. This was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone enjoys the conference and gets exactly what they need from it. Oh, and Abby, will you put your um, Instagram in the chat too as well? Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. All right. Okay, so we have another um, commercial from 
mindful Dina Joy. So I will let Andy get that queued up. There we go. There's no denying mindfulness offers a myriad of benefits to our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well being. But practicing mindfulness with a traumatic brain injury and post traumatic stress is a very different experience. And some methods can actually do more harm than good. Guided meditations I found online were difficult to listen to. The background music was painful, the voice was irritating, or the words triggered a trauma response, and I wasn't alone. So I recorded guided meditations specifically for those of us living with sensory sensitivities, trauma triggers, and dissociation as a result of our brain injury. These meditations have helped many of us mindfully transform our lives. Join us and transform your life, too. All right. So unfortunately, um, Dina Joy was supposed to be here with us, but she had another concussion last week. So she had to bow out. Um, however, Dr. Mallory agreed to step in and do some mindfulness for us today. Yay. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, Mallory Fox lives in Arizona. And she is both a survivor and a professional. And she was on last year's uh, virtual day with us as well. And I had the absolute pleasure of meeting her in Phoenix a couple of years ago. And um, she's been on my podcast. And I just adore you, Mallory. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm sending all of the good vibes for healing to Tina Joy and hope that she recovers quickly. And um, thank you so much, Amy, for hosting this incredible event. It was truly the highlight of my year last year, connecting with everyone and attending virtually. And I want to acknowledge each of you who showed up today to be a part of this community virtually. Um, I see you and I know the effort that it can take to um, turn on a computer and spend some time in front of the screen and to hear stories and to um, feel seen by others' experiences. Um, I have some tears in my eyes just from hearing the previous two speakers. So um, thank you to Amy and Patty for showing up and sharing your stories and um, to everyone who's going to speak today and share. And to everyone who shows up in any way. And one thing that can be really challenging after a brain injury is to have screen time. So for the next several minutes, I'm going to invite you to do whatever supports you. If that means you want to lay down and just listen to my voice, if that means you need to turn my voice off and give yourself a few moments of rest, and truly, if that means... Um, you're, you're welcome to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. And you're welcome to try something and then allow yourself to stop if it doesn't feel right. Just like each brain injury is different. Each one of us who showed up today is different. We have different things that feel good to us. We have different things that don't feel good for us. And part of mindfulness is that journey of discovering what's right for each one of us as we notice life as it happens around us. So we'll start with a little bit of a mindful movement and that could be just noticing your body breathing. You might close your eyes. You might find just a soft gaze looking at somewhere in your space. So I'm just looking to the side where, you know, there's a little spot that I can bring my focus to. And as I mentioned, you could lie down, you could sit up, you could lean against something, you could stand if that feels good for you. And we're going to use our five senses to just start to notice how we're doing right now, how things are unfolding around us. So we'll start by just noticing anything that you see. If your eyes are open, you might notice the carpet fibers that you're looking at or the texture of tile. If your eyes are closed, you might have some visual memories coming up. 
or you might be really intently studying the inside of your eyelids. Taking a moment to just see what's in this space with you. Next, we're going to notice any sounds that you hear. So you're probably hearing my voice. You might be hearing the sound of people or animals or activity in the space that you're in. You might hear my dogs or the fan that I have in this room, sounds coming through from the space that I'm in. And then next we're going to get curious and notice any sensations, anything that you feel touching your body. And sometimes after a brain injury, sensations can be overwhelming. Sometimes experiencing life can feel really overwhelming. So if that's happening for you, you're welcome to bring your attention back to your body breathing or to do something that supports you right as you are. You might try pressing your feet down into the ground or pressing your hands together, or just noticing anything that's making contact with your body. And then next, let's take a deep breath in through the nose, big inhale. and notice anything that you might smell. And you might notice the absence of smell. And know that scent can bring up experiences and memories. You know too that sometimes the absence of scent can bring up emotions. So if you're experiencing emotion at anything that you're noticing, you can return back to your breath or do something that helps you to feel connected in this moment. And to round off our journey in the five senses, just taking a moment to notice if there's anything that you taste. You might swallow. You might notice that takes you on a thought journey of what's the last thing that I had? I had some tea right before I turned my video on. And know that the mind wandering is part of being a human. It's part of how our brains are programmed to keep us alive. And so if you're feeling stress or frustration at not staying with the mindfulness activity, know that that's totally normal. All right, so using any of our five senses can help us to practice mindfulness because mindfulness is really just noticing what happens as life unfolds. And we're gonna add in a little movement. And again, you're welcome to continue to stay in the position that you're in. You don't need to get up or move to do this movement. We're gonna just start with gently opening and closing the hands, moving the fingers, circling the wrists, you might progress to bending and extending the arms or flipping the palms and dropping the palms. You might then move into the shoulders. You might be finding movement that doesn't look like mine, but feels good for you. And we'll move into the spine. If you feel any dizziness or nausea, you're welcome again to stop doing the movement and do something that feels right for you. It might feel good to bring the arms up over the head in a big good morning stretch. It might feel really good to just keep the eyes closed and place one hand over the heart and breathe into your hands. Place one hand over the belly and breathe into both hands. Really just finding some movement that feels good for you, that helps you to tune in to the present moment, which will help you then to be present and aware 
and ready for the next incredible speaker. To close our mindfulness practice, let's bring one hand over the other above the heart. And let's take a deep breath in, even though we're all separated in different states and provinces and countries. And let's take a big, deep breath in together. Big inhale. And big exhale. If your eyes were closed, then you may open them. If you had your attention um, on an object and you're welcome to bring it back to the screen. And just know that even though we're all showing up separately from our own locations, that we're united with the purpose of making brain injury not invisible. We see each other and you're so important and valued for being here. Thanks for being here. Oh, Amy, I think you're still muted. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mallory. And, you know, I hope everyone noticed how just taking one big deep breath just like shifted your entire energy in your body and how it can have such a grounding effect. And, just being aware that you always have your breath. Your breath is the one autonomic system that you can take control over. Like it will do the work. We don't have to think about it. It's automatic, but we can take control over it. And we were given that capability for a reason and, you know, helping us get out of fight or flight and getting back into rest and digest just by taking a few deep breaths and bringing yourself into the present moment is just so powerful. Um, it's a great tool for your toolbox. Mallory, thank you so much. I just, I love having you here. I'm so glad you were able to make it and fill in on such short notice. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. Thank you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker, we have Renee Roman Nose from Wilsonville, Oregon, and she is a brain injury survivor. You are muted, Renee. You can take yourself. There you go. And um, thank you so much for being here, Renee. Well, thank you for the kind invitation. I think that the work that this organization does is so invaluable. I read all the emails. I just really appreciate the outreach that you do. And Thank this you. is such a, a silent thing. People just don't realize the effects of it and how um, they last so long. And I was in a terrible car accident in 2010. And after the car accident, I couldn't speak with any fluency. I couldn't remember numbers. I couldn't remember my vocabulary and I had just graduated with my master's degree. If I had not graduated then, I wouldn't have been able to at that time. But I'm here to tell you that healing does not end at a certain time. I've heard that said when I first was injured, oh, you'll heal within four years and that's gonna be the max you ever get. Well, that's not true. And <clears throat> I'm happy to say that, you know, your brain is a muscle. You keep working it like any other muscle. You go to the gym to work out your body, do things that exercise your mind as well. For me, that's the spoken word. I do a lot of poetry and I'm gonna read two poems for you guys, uh, for everyone at this time. The first one is wind song. And I hope that these touch you and help you in some way. So I invite you to close your eyes if you wish or keep them open, it's up to you. This is called wind song. The wind carries messages for those with ears to hear. The trees carry signs for those with eyes to see. The forest tells stories to those who can read. The eagle beckons to those whose spirits are free. Now, freedom comes from within. Um, we free ourselves when we acknowledge there are those in our lives who don't understand what we're going through 
or don't have patience for what we're going through. And I'm sad to say that I have actually lost friends because of my TBI. And I, th I think for them and for me, that was a healthy choice for them to choose to move on in their lives. And I cherish the time that we spent, but I also understand that I have to surround myself with understanding, compassionate people who, who also share my joy of life. And I focus on life. I don't focus on negativity. And I think that that's also been a big help for me. I was going to spoken word events uh, once a week, and I would ask the audience for three words. And then I would create a poem on the stage in front of everyone with those three words. But in the beginning, I frequently could not remember the third word as I was partway through my poem. But because the community that I was surrounded with was so supportive, uh, I would merely say, I can't remember the third word. And someone would shout it out. And then I would complete the poem. But that exercise gave me more confidence. It helped me to realize that what I'm going through is just, um, just another thing in life, right? You know, things happen. We break bones. We fall down. We scrape our knees. Uh, we get our hearts broken. Uh, TBI doesn't have to be the end. It can be a new beginning. And for me, I decided after um, that car accident that the rest of my life, the next half of my life, I would focus more on art. So I took painting lessons. Uh, I did more photography and I've had three art shows, um, one in New York, two in Washington state. And those are things I never dreamed of before my accident. Um, but having the accident and having the TBI and realizing these are things I want to do. And whether I stumble and fall and whether people like my art or not is not important. Do I like it? Do I um, gather enjoyment and happiness from doing art and from sharing it with people who love me? Uh, yes. Absolutely, I do. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. And I realize we're a little bit behind time. So I'm going to um, share with you another poem and then wrap it up. And I thank you so much for listening. I appreciate your kind sharing of your time today. This is called Eternal Song. I feel the song of a thousand years. I smell the earth of my ancestors. I see the sky that looked on other nations. I hear the song that carries us through the ages. I taste the victory so long denied. And that's what recovery is. It's a victory. Whether it's a small victory or a large victory, it is still a victory. I'm able now to remember a phone number, to look at a, a number and go, okay, let me put that in my phone. Whereas right after the accident and for years after the accident, I could not. I, people would say, oh, call me. My number is 503, blah, blah, blah. And I'd go five. What's the next number? And things like that. And, you know, we, so many of us have been through those things. And I realize that's a small example of the struggles that we um, have overcome or are overcoming or are confronting. But I'm here to tell you that there's hope ahead. And there is recovery ahead and get to where you want to get to. And that's all you need. So lean on those who love you. Let them lean on you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for the kind invitation, Amy. Oh, thank you so much, Renee. This was lovely. Um, I just want to acknowledge your like ability, like when you were on stage and asked for the three words, and then like, sometimes you couldn't remember that third word, um, just props to you. Like that had to have been so outside your comfort zone, but yet at the same time, you were building neuroplasticity by doing that. Um, yes. I just think that's so cool. And your example about phone numbers, that was so frustrating for me. I would look at the phone number on a piece of paper, 437, four, and I would like hit the wrong numbers. I would know that they were the wrong numbers, but I would still hit the wrong numbers. 
And it was so, and, and this was when I still had a landline for my business. So on a smartphone, you can like back up to correct your number, but on a landline, you got to start over. And it would take me like six times to dial a phone number. It was so frustrating. So I, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And just thank you for being here. What a beautiful story. Your poems are beautiful. Is there anywhere people can find your poems? Um, absolutely. Um, my book was published by Uttered Chaos Press, and it's called Sweet Grass Talking. Let me see if I can. Uh oh, the virtual background. <laughs> yeah, um, um, oh, there we go. Sweet, okay. sweet grass talking. Yeah. And so this is also one of my, uh, if you can barely see it. Okay, this is also an art piece that I did in beadwork, and it's about wow. that size. Yeah. So um, in my stuff, I have a spoken word CD coming out in uh, later this spring. It'll be on Spotify and Amazon and all the, you know, Amazing. the usual places. So just, just keep writing, just keep performing, just keep doing things that bring you joy. Oh, thank you so much, Renee. And go ahead and put in the chat afterwards, the name of your book. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for you, being everyone. here. All right, I believe we have a quick little commercial next from Broken Wings. Um, Jennifer, uh, if you are here and you have your name different, um, just raise your hand in, in the, on the bottom, you can select to raise your hand and Andy can find you because um, we're not finding you if you are here. Um, but go ahead, Andy, and you can pull up our commercial. Greetings, everyone. My name is Twyla Reed, best-selling author, founder, and CEO of Broken Wings Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization created to provide resources, education, mentorship, and brain injury prevention insight to traumatic brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and their family members. And I am super duper duper excited about the upcoming virtual conference. I will be one of the speakers and I will be sharing with you five tips to help you turn your traumatic events into empowering moments. I hope you can join me. You don't want to miss it. I'll see you soon. All right. So without further ado, our next speaker is Twyla Reed, and she is a caregiver from Savannah, Georgia. So welcome, Twyla. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's I'm um, happy to be here today. Well, we're happy to have you here. All right, I'm going to let you take it over. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Twyla Reed. I am the founder and president of Broken Wings Incorporated, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And um, as stated, we provide education, uh, resources, prevention, insight, to brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and their family members. And what we do is we actually give them the tools that they need to teach them how to create the life that they desire in spite of the challenges that they face after surviving a brain injury. And um, as stated, I am a best-selling author. Um, and today, um, first, I want to just share with you um, some things to help you on your journey before I talk a little bit about the books. Uh, you know, um, as a caregiver now for almost 21 years, my son sustained a severe traumatic brain injury when he was 11 years old from a horrific car accident. And um, so I, it put me really in a place. Um, I didn't have a clue about traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm, a, I'm an Army veteran. I did 20 years in the military. But even as a, a senior non-commissioned officer, I did not know anything about traumatic brain injury. And, and so being placed in that role all of a sudden, it really um, gave me a, a, a rude awakening as to um, just how uneducated I was about brain injury. And so I was on a mission after that to be able to help other survivors and other caregivers who may, you know, just be in the same situation um, that we found ourselves in. And, um, you know, 1.5 million Americans sustain a brain injury every year. And out of those 1.5 million, 230,000 survive and live, 50,000 die, and 80 to 90,000 are left with uh, some type of permanent disability. Well, we uh, fall into that 80 to 90 percent. 
And uh, not only that, but my son sustained what we call polytrauma. There were secondary and primary disabilities, um, things like um, seizures and the ability to, or the in, or aphasia. I know I saw that mentioned, and just you know the um, the socialization skills. You know he has damage to his frontal lobe, which deals with your executive thinking. So his reasoning and his judgment and his decision making, all those things were impaired. And so I want to just talk about. Uh, five things that that can really help you, you know, just kind of uh, uh, celebrate your journey, if you will, and not be ashamed of who you are after sustaining a traumatic brain injury. And the first thing I want you to do is to just learn how to appreciate the big picture. And what do I mean by that? You may be saying, well, how can you appreciate the big picture after sustaining a brain injury? Well, Celebrate the things that matter. Concentrate on the things that really matter in life. You made it through. You're here. You're here to share your journey. So think about that. Yeah, you can uh, You maybe wallow in the things that are going wrong, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to think about the things that truly matter and celebrate those things. And then I want you to uh, change your perception of who you are. Be confident. Show up and show out when you go when you go places show up and be great in who you are travel your journey with pride keep your head up high yeah you've gone through something that's been traumatic but you've made it out victorious and now you have a mandate to share your story with others use your words because they do have power you know your i am your i cans and your i am and your i will I will celebrate myself. I will be happy on this journey. Those things, your words definitely do have power. And next, I want you to concentrate on the good things that you have going on in your life. Get involved in your local community, your local brain injury support groups. I invite you all to, um, to join us. We have an online Facebook um, support group, Broken Wings Brain Injury Empowerment Group. We are a very loving family and we just love on each other. We encourage each other. And I will post that in the chat um, later. Next, I want you to apply defining meaning, something optimistic. I want you to see the glass as being half full and not half empty. I want you to uh, use this, um, this tragedy that's occurred to make you better and not bitter. And how, do, how can you do that? Share your story. Share your testimony of hoping healing with others. Yes, you can do that because guess what? There's someone waiting to hear about your journey. They may be stuck in an area and just really don't know how to get through it. And out of all of the billions of people in the world, guess what? There's someone who's gone through exactly what you have experienced. So by sharing your journey, you're gonna help someone you're gonna be able to come together and say, hey, wait a minute, I've experienced that. And they're going to be able to share with you and you're gonna be able to share with them tips to help you both get through those things. And the last thing I wanna share as far as the tips is to um, think about your own personal strength. You are a brain injury survivor, okay? The person that you were before the survivor, you're still there. You're still that fun, loving, caring person that you were. You were someone that can bring humor to others. That person did not go away. You simply sustained a brain injury. So use that, use that to, to, to make yourself a better person. Don't be, uh, again, don't be afraid. Uh, uh, use the confidence that you have. Think about the things that matter. Um, you be proud of yourself because there wasn't a roadmap uh, that, that, that came with being a survivor or the caregiver. Um, as stated, I'm a caregiver and have been now for almost 21 years. June 18, 2001 was a day that changed our lives forever. And I'm gonna go a little bit um, into uh, the books. This is my signature book, Broken Wings. And it is our story of my son's recovery uh, through his traumatic brain injury. And I'm uh, just gonna uh, read uh, a little bit, uh, just a tad bit of the introduction. And then I wanna show you uh, the book for the caregivers as well. Um, who would have ever thought June 18, 2001 
will be a day that our lives will be changed forever. My name is Twyla Reed, and this is the story about my son, Mylon, who is a severe traumatic brain injury survivor. He was an 11 year old honor roll student who made all A's and B's in school. During this time, he was preparing to attend pre-college classes for math and science at one of the local universities. Three days out of the week, he would go to the local recreation center after school where he was part of the local basketball team. He would often tell me his dream was to go to college and play. From there, he planned on being drafted into the pros. He had big plans for the future and always told me that he was gonna make sure that I was taken care of. Well, I walked into the rec center and he yelled to me, mom, five more minutes and he, as he made a three pointer. He climbed into the back seat of the car, he buckled up and we began talking about his practice. We were two blocks away from our home when all of a sudden, wham, a car pulled out of nowhere and hit us, knocking us into the opposite lane of traffic. I screamed and that was all I remember until we came to a halt. When the car stopped, glass was everywhere. I was bleeding profusely from my head and I suddenly realized what had happened. We had been in an accident. After looking around me, I saw people everywhere. I couldn't move at first, but slowly began to look into the back seat. And what I saw was a sight that plagued my memory forever. There in the back seat, was my son Mylon, slumped over, unresponsive, on the opposite side from where he was before the accident. I tried to kick the door open, but I couldn't. I beat on it with my fist and I still couldn't open it. So I jumped over the back seat and I put him in my arms. And at that time, I realized that his scalp was literally dangling from his head. I placed his scalp on top of his head and I could feel the fractured skull. I began to scream and pray and ask God to please don't take my son away. And as I sat in the back seat with him, cradled in my arms, a gentleman opened the door and he said, I'm a doctor and I'm here to help. I knew then that God had heard my prayers. He pulled me from the car and began to work on my own instantly. I immediately began hearing sirens and I knew that the ambulance were on their way. So I'm not going to go any further. You guys have to get the book to read a little bit more. Also, and this book is a bestseller is also. And this book, uh, just because I have a brain injury doesn't mean, is a book that um, I sat down with Mylon and I helped him write. One day I picked Mylon up from work and he was ears um, because he just felt that people did not understand him. So we sat down and we wrote things that every survivor wants you to know about. So I encourage you to also um, to take a look at this book as well. It's a bestseller. And last but not least, I want to talk about the caregivers books that I have. What do you do when caregivers need caregiving? You know, oftentimes as the caregiver, uh, people truly forget um, the things that we deal with, the things that we go through in life, the lonely days, the lonely nights, the family that's there in the beginning, but then they're no longer there in the end. You know, they slowly but surely stop coming around and stop calling. They go on with their lives. But you, the caregiver, uh, you're there because guess what? When no one else understands, the caregiver does. When others won't or, or, and, and can't, the caregiver will. And so, but you have to remember to take care of yourself as the caregiver. And so this book, um, is specifically for caregivers. Uh, New York Times bestselling author Omar Tyree did the foreword for this book. And also um, have Confessions of a Caregiver where I brought along a few other caregivers with me and we just really open up our heart and we allow you to come into um, our world of caregiving and share our deepest, darkest things that we think about as caregivers and some of the things that we go through as caregivers. Um, also, I have a goal setting journal for traumatic brain injury survivors. Um, just a lot of resources. Um, we have a um, we have a word search book. We have a, a Sudoku. Um, just a lot of, of of resources for the brain injury survivor to really help you out. 
So I want to uh, invite you to please connect with me. Um, I'm available for speaking engagements. You can reach out to me by email at info at twilowreed.com. And you can also visit my website at twilowreed.com to um, check out some of the books and the resources. And Amy, thank you. Happy birthday to you. We definitely need to connect. I follow you. I've been watching you for a long time. And I just truly applaud all that you do for the brain injury community and would love um, you know, to connect more with you in the future. Thank you, Twyla. And is the best place to find your books at your website? Yes, um, you can find the books on my website. They're also on Amazon, they're in Walmart, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, Books a Million and uh, pretty much bookstores around the world. Perfect. Well, would you mind putting your website in the chat when you get off of here um, so people yes. can find all those wonderful books. Thank you so much yes, for being here, Twyla. Thank you all and God bless you all. All right. Okay, moving right along. Our next speaker is Brittany Sweeney Lawson from the Brain Injury Alliance, or Alliance of Arizona. So she is a professional working um, for the Brain Injury Alliance. And so welcome. Thanks, Amy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. There's always that little fear. Uh, well, first, thank you so much, Amy, for having me here. And happy birthday to you. Thank I can't you. imagine a no problem. I can't imagine a party I'd rather be attending right now. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> As Amy said, my name is Brittany Sweeney Lawson, and I'm a certified brain injury specialist and program manager for a statewide nonprofit called the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona. So in a nutshell, we help connect survivors of all types of acquired brain injuries, their families, and the professionals who work with them um, to education, information, resources, and programs to help them along the path of their recovery journeys. It's been a humbling experience to be invited to walk with people during some of their darkest moments, as well as in the sunshine of their successes. But even before I crossed paths with the Brain Injury Alliance, brain injury had already touched my lives, my, my lives, my life in ways I never would have imagined. I was working in the Dominican Republic circa 2013, I believe, when I received the news that my grandfather had had a stroke and I had no idea what that meant. I was 25 at the time and to my knowledge, I hadn't actually met anyone with a brain injury survivor who was a brain injury survivor before. So my mom explained to me via email, because that was the best way to communicate, that things were going to be different and to try to prepare me for what to expect when I saw him again. But as most of us know, there's no teacher quite like personal experience. So my circumstances at the time made it so I couldn't leave the Dominican Republic right away. So the next time I saw my grandfather, or Pops, as I refer to him as, um, was in early 2014. But when I did see him again, gone was the goofy guy who relished beating me at board games mercilessly, taking me out for Jack in the Box tacos, and going on family camping trips by the beach. In his place was someone who was much quieter, averse to loud noises, and whose aphasia made it three times as hard for him to understand what we were telling him or for him to express what he wanted to tell us. Since my pops's first stroke, the second one actually occurred two weeks before my wedding in 2018, I have met and spoken to thousands of amazing brain injury survivors as well as their dedicated family caregivers. I've been fascinated to observe that while I never ever hear the same story twice, all the stories are the same in that every single person is fighting like hell for their lives. And what's more, they're doing it under a cloak of invisibility as brain injury is still not yet a well-known factor in the general public consciousness. Too often survivors of brain injury are just categorized into these neat little boxes when brain injury is anything but tidy. It reminds me of why I hate sayings like, there are two kinds of people in this world. And then it's usually followed by some overly simplistic comparison. However, one exception to this rule is the story that's commonly attributed to either the Cherokee or Lenape tribes, and it's called 
the two wolves. So if you haven't heard it before, it basically goes like this. There's a young boy who goes to his grandfather. He's angry at another boy who's insulted him. And his grandfather in turn tells him that, I too have felt great hate for those who have taken so much with no sorrow for what they do. But hate is like taking poison and wishing you and wishing your enemy would die. So it's as if there are two wolves that are battling inside me. One is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all those who are around him. But the other wolf is full of anger. The littlest things will set him off into a fit of temper. He fights everyone all the time for no reason at all. And he cannot think straight because his anger and hate are so great. Sometimes it is hard to live with these two wolves inside me because both are trying to dominate my spirit. So the boy thinks about this for a minute and then he asks, well, which wolf wins then? And the grandfather replies, the one that you feed. So I've loved this story as long as I can remember because it's a brilliant depiction of the potential for good and evil inside all of us. But it also occurred to me that after a brain injury, yet another wolf can emerge that's neither good nor evil. It's more of a rebirth. The third wolf oftentimes finds itself needing to relearn how to be a wolf again. The third wolf could also be classified as a lone wolf since brain injury is often an isolating experience where the wolf may struggle to reconnect with its pack and if the wolf was once a mighty hunter or a great leader or simply a proud member of its pack who are they now that they can't necessarily contribute in the ways they once did so the third wolf brings with it more questions than it does answers and also unlike the good and evil wolves which are easily identified the third wolf has many faces in fact, from the outside, you may not know it was the third wolf at all. They probably look fine. So is the third wolf simply a wolf in sheep's clothing? Not hardly. In fact, there are many valuable lessons I've learned from working with the third wolf of brain injury. The first being to be truly heard and understood is divine. I can't count the number of times people I've spoken to have said something along the lines of, thank you for not rushing me off the phone. It's just so comforting to speak with someone who gets it. And the third wolf or those who care for one don't usually need our advice or judgment, but having someone who's willing to empathize with them when their world has been turned upside down, who will slow down and repeat information multiple times if needed, and who is willing to just simply be there. That is a gift that has no price. Secondly, looks are deceiving. I'm not a gambling gal, but I will 100% bet against you every time if you think telling a brain injury survivor that they look fine will be taken as a compliment. It's not and probably never will be. When the injury is to your brain and the brain is inside of you, there's no way to know how someone is actually doing simply by looking at them. Yes, even if they're smiling and seeming happy, you never really know what's behind the smile or going on behind the scenes. Instead, trying a, how are you doing? Or seriously, how are you really doing? And what can I do to help if you need it? Actions are always worth more than assumptions. Um, the third point is the right support at the right time is crucial. So at the Brain Injury Alliance, we never have a discharge date for people that we work with because what one survivor or caregiver needs immediately post-injury is going to look very different than what they might need weeks, months, or even years later. So getting connected with a specialist, therapist, social security, disability attorney, et cetera, who really understands the effects of brain injury can be the difference between getting access to critical care and services or falling through the cracks of willing but imperfect systems. Also, finding your pack is part of the healing process. While the lone wolf is portrayed as being cool and doing its own thing, in real life as humans, we're pack animals and we thrive off of social interaction. So this is true of third wolves as well. I've talked to survivors who lost friends after their brain injury. I know that was mentioned a couple speakers before me as well, and ended up sitting on the couch every day watching the same game shows. So while self-isolation can be part of the initial healing and recovery process, it's not a healthy state to remain in indefinitely. So fortunately, there are a variety of ways to connect with other third wolves or caregivers in this day and age, such as support groups, brain injury conferences, virtual gatherings, and a whole lot more. So if you need a place to start, checking out the Brain Injury Alliance or Association in your state 
or you can get connected with Faces of TBI. Those are both options. And finally, self-care is not optional. If I've learned anything in my line of work, it's that if you don't make time to care for your mind, body, and spirit, they will force you to make the time. And this goes for everyone, but I think it's of the utmost importance for, sub, for survivors and caregivers alike. And self-care goes beyond just like a nice bubble bath or eating a favorite snack. It's about finding the well with the water that fills you and drinking deeply. We are no good for others when we aren't good to ourselves. So treating yourself well isn't an if I get to it type of luxury. It's a true life replenishing necessity. There are millions of third wolves among us, approximately 5.3 million in the United States alone, in fact, and they have much to teach us if we're willing to pay attention. Or as my pops likes to say, if you keep your ears open more and your mouth open less, you're bound to learn twice as much. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Such a great story. I haven't heard that one before. That was a really great analogy. Nope, I think she froze. Oh, thank, um, thank you. <laughs> and thanks oh, so much for having me. It's been a great event so far. Yeah, and thank you. Okay. And say hi to thank Carrie. you for having me. I will. Have a good rest of your and Say hi to Carrie. Uh, Arizona has been one of the biggest supporters for me, and I appreciate, got you, appreciate all of you so much. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. All right. Okay. I believe we have a commercial. Oh, wait. No, we don't. Our next, we have our next speaker, then we have a commercial. So our next speaker is Leah Davidson, and she is from Ontario, Canada, and she is joining us as a professional. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. Thank you for having me and a very happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Leah Davidson, and I am a speech language pathologist in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I have been working in the area of traumatic brain injury for the past 23 years. And I've also am a life coach and I work with people um, from everywhere really who want to work on their mindset, how to handle their stress and overwhelm and deal with life adversities and become more confident and resilient. I'm also the host of um, the Building Resilience podcast. And finally, I'm currently creating a memory course as the brain is one of my passions. So that's a lot of information I just threw at you. Does anybody even remember my name? Maybe not. So if you have suffered a traumatic brain injury, chances are you have experienced some challenges with your memory. And what's more, even without a TBI, as people age, we start to experience challenges with our memory. And memory is so important to us for a couple of reasons. And that's why today I wanted to share with you just some practical tips that you can use to help with your memory, because I know for most people, TBI, it's something that they're challenged with. So firstly, in many ways, our memories shape who we are. In the end, that is what we have. Our memories are our personal recordings that we use to process what has just happened to us and then after to relive and prove to ourselves that it even happened at all. And memory is an important piece of our identity. Memory can also serve very, very practical purposes. It allows us to function on a day-to-day -day basis, to engage with other people, to get things done, to be productive, and to be independent. And memory plays a huge role in our lives, and that's why when our memory changes or is challenged, it is a huge source of frustration for you and has some great practical implications. It also impacts your self-esteem and your overall identity. So if you've experienced a brain injury, these things may be familiar to you. You may be then particularly interested in learning more about how to compensate and improve your memory. And that's what I'm gonna share with you, a couple of tips. First, gonna just share with you what memory is, introduce you to a framework that I use, and then give you some specific tips on how to remember names, because that is one um, area that most people complain about. So in its simplest form, memories are made by connections in your nerve cells that get stronger with repeated associations or won't take hold if they're weakened. So when you make a memory, you're literally changing your brain. And there's a process for making your memory, and that involves different parts of your brain. 
First, you need to pay attention to what you have to remember. Then you need to get it into your brain. Then your, need, your brain needs to take that information and find a way to collect all the details together and connect things. So we call that encoding and consolidation. Then your brain needs to keep it in. Once it's encoded, it's like we get the memory in the door. Now, where do we put the memory? And the brain tries to link it up with things that it already knows to make it easier and save things together. And this is what we call storage. And then finally, we have to be able to access that memory when we've made it, whenever we want to. And that's the retrieval process. So there's three main stages. Get it in, keep it in, get it out. And challenges, as you know, can happen at any stage along the way, which means that you have to be working on things at any stage along the way. There's things that you can do with your lifestyle to improve these three areas, and there's also strategies that you can use. Now, first, there's some general things, and I use a framework that I, called, I call MAP, Lifestyle, and Tools. Now, the M in MAP stands for three M's, Mindset, mot Motivation, and Meaning. In order to remember anything, you first have to work on your mindset, your belief on whether it's possible to improve your memory. Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, everything is mindset. Secondly, it's motivation. Now, in order to remember something, you have to be really motivated. If you don't care about something, your brain is really not going to perk up and listen and pay attention. For example, you may not care that my name is Leah Davidson or the things that I told you about at the beginning, but if I had said, anybody here if they remember my name, I'm going to give them a million dollars. You can bet that your motivation would have improved, increased, and your brain would have started searching for ways to keep that memory alive. So motivation really counts. Finally, meaning. If something's meaningful to you, you're more likely to remember it. Now, the A in MAP stands for attention. Many people think that they have a memory problem when really what they have is an attention problem. You can't remember what you don't pay attention to. Without attention, there is nothing to remember. And finally, the last P stands for practice. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes progress. And our amazing brain has the ability to change and rewire and new learn new things with the power of neuroplasticity, but it's not a quick process. It requires practice over and over and over. Our brain uses pathways that are very well worn. Now, often with injury, some of those paths, it's like they have roadblocks and they're completely inaccessible. And the way you used to remember is no longer effective. So you have to create a new route. You have to keep doing things over and over and over and eventually a new path will form and your brain will start using that path. But it takes a lot of practice and a lot of patience. So those are three general things that you need to have to work on any areas of your memory. Now today I just want to introduce you to some specific tools and tips you can use to remember names. So if we go through, we're going to use the acronym of names, N-A-M-E-S. What does N stands for? The N is to name it right away. We only have a few seconds to hold something in our head before we lose it. So we need to find a way to keep it there as long as we can. So as soon as we hear something, as soon as we hear a name, we want to repeat it. So if I say, hi, my name is Leah, it may be, oh, Leah, it's nice to meet you. You want to repeat the name back to the person. That way, if you lose it and it's gone already, you know right away and the person's able to give it to you again. The next A stands for associate it. You want to link it to something else. Maybe you have a cousin named Leah, so you may associate it with that person. Or when I was growing up, often people would refer to Princess Leia and Star Wars. It was enough similarity that Leia and Leah, they would make that association. The goal is to find something that's already solid in your mind, link it to what is new. Learning is basically all about taking something we don't know and linking it to something that we know already. So we can learn names this way. You can associate it with something that is also like a physical trait. For example, Leah's blonde has a Canadian accent. M means mention it. This ties into practice. As you're talking with the person, you wanna to try to mention their name a few times, not obsessively, because you don't wanna look weird, but a couple times during the conversation or maybe at the end when you leave. And if you forget it, it's still early enough on in the conversation that you're less embarrassed to say, I'm sorry, I totally forgot your name and they can give it to you again. The E stands for extra. 
And these are all the little things that you can do to boost memories. For example, Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was asked, he, was, he had this strategy that when somebody gave a name, he would visualize writing it on their forehead in a big black marker. So picture writing Leah across my forehead in a big marker. It is doing something extra to help the brain perk up to remember. If it's an unusual name, you can ask them to spell it or ask them about it if it's something that, if there's a story behind why they were named that. Now, lastly, it's spaced retrieval. Spaced retrieval is basically just a fancy word for a form of repeating and practice, but it's that the idea that you repeat the name right away, then a few minutes later, then you keep repeating it and practicing it with larger time intervals in between. So example, after two minutes, after five minutes, after 15, after 30, after an hour, three hours, 12 hours, you get the point. It's kind of like you quiz yourself every so often. So these are techniques that are great to use and they do work but you've got to be patient with yourself and you don't want to end up going to a party and try to learn leaving all 20 names of people. Pick one small thing and move on from that. And of course, the best strategy is always writing something down. Just jot down a note on your phone with the person's name and maybe something that you associated with them. And if there was something extra about them, you can jot that down. So those are just a few tips that I have for you. I know that memory can be a challenge for everybody, so I hope that you're able to just use a couple of these things and help your memory out. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Leah. Those were great tips. I know I think a lot of people um, struggle with remembering names, and I know that I do try to repeat somebody's name back to them, um, but it doesn't always stick. <laughs> it doesn't always stick. You've got to do a couple extra mm -hmm. things, and you got to be really patient with yourself. I think sometimes just coming out and saying to people, like, I'm so sorry, I've totally forgotten your name, is one of the best things that we can do, and then they'll repeat it again. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much, Leah, for being here today. It was a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Now we have a quick commercial from Lightbridge Inc. And I will let Andy go ahead and get that queued up. Welcome to Lightbridge, a technology company designed to improve the lives of people suffering from traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder. We developed the Lightbridge app to connect patients, whom we call members, with their network of support contacts, as well as tools to facilitate their activities of daily living. The app reminds members to check in from time to time and choose an icon that best illustrates how they're feeling. The Lightbridge app notifies caregivers, healthcare professionals, support groups, family, and friends based on a customizable list of contacts. The app also offers easy to follow routines to assist members with physical therapy rehab, medication reminders, tutorials, bill paying, and even expressing positive affirmations. This enables a proactive care model where updates on a member's well-being are seamlessly delivered to support contacts, helping them know when an individual is thriving or when a follow-up might be appropriate. Wonderful. So our next speaker to join us is Joy Lewis, and she is a caregiver from Nebraska. So welcome. Welcome, Joy. <laughs> Hello, Amy, and happy birthday to you, honey. I didn't know it was your birthday, but I'm super excited to be here today with Thank you. you. Um, as like others have said, I have followed you for as long as I can remember. Um, you know, when our son was uh, injured in 2001 in a car accident. He suffered a traumatic brain injury at the age of 18. And so I would like most of you, I'm sure our story is not unique. We searched high and low. You try to learn as much as you can, as fast as you can, and understand uh, what you're dealing with. Because back then uh, he was in the hospital unconscious for four days woke up, he could brush his teeth, he could eat, he knew all of us, and so they sent him home with us. <laughs> so that was as much support as we got, and then we had to try to figure things out on our own. So from there, we learned a lot. Uh, I think all of us probably consume a lot of information. 
I know I did uh, everything I could read, everything I could get my hands on. And what I found was that I had a lot of information, but it, I didn't have a way to apply it to our life. And um, so what we what we decided as a family, and it, it took us a few years, we've been working on this app for about six years now. And uh, so it took us a while to kind of get our heads around if we were to do something with this information to help people live better, what would that be? And so Jordan, our son, who is now 39, believe it or not, and he actually designed the app. And so this app has been a family mission of love, not only for Jordan, but also for others like him and for other caregivers like me, because it's a uh, traumatic brain injury affects all of our lives, not just the person who's injured, but the whole family is affected. And so our hope with the app is that it's been designed to help people with memory issues, to help people live more independently. And when we build routines around everyday activities that we have to do, like for Jordan, we have a pay your car insurance routine. We have a something fun routine because we all get caught up in this life and we forget to like people have said previously, take care of ourselves. So we have a take care of yourself routine, do something you love routine. It's not all a to-do list. Uh, we also have a routine that, that shows you how to manage stress. So whatever you think about doing or whatever you're trying to accomplish or whatever is a challenge in your life, you can build a routine around that. And you can make progress just step by step. Don't overwhelm yourself. That's not what this app is about. It's just about taking that one step to maybe organize something that causes you stress every day. And the other, the other option we have is the check-in, which you saw. There's five emojis. We don't make you analyze yourself to death because that's no fun for anyone. And so there's five emojis. You pick one you add a comment to it like it, you know some days we just all wake up and we feel a little overwhelmed so i may check in less than optimal and i may say because i'm feeling a little overwhelmed today my support contacts receive that message in a text they don't have to have the app it's just someone that you set up your support contacts through the contacts that are already in your mobile device and then you can you can select when you want them to receive notifications. And all of this is on the website, you guys, as a tutorial. So don't feel like you have to remember all of this. You can access it on our website. And it's, it's super easy. And I'll share the website with everyone at the end of this so that you can, I'll share it on chat, Amy, if that's okay. So what we have is a check-in then. And, and, you know, the worst thing about this for Jordan was he would never reach out when he was in trouble until it was way too late. I would get the phone call that says, mom, you need to come now. I, I can't live another day like this. And let me tell you, you are the strongest people I know. You wake up every day knowing that every day is going to be different. And every day you're going to face challenges that you don't see coming. And God bless you because I swear you are stronger than most of us people that are living life. And you inspire me. You have made it so that this mission in my life has become the best job I could ever ask for and ever have. Because I fight every day knowing that you guys are strong enough to do the same. And so just so you know, we have a bunch more features we want to build. This is a start. It's the routine builder and the check-in. It's super easy. And the reason we want to start with this is because we have to put things on top of it. 
So as we build new features, they're going to go on top of these two features. And so if we have any changes to make, it's much more cost effective for us to make them now versus to wait. So um, I hope you guys check out the app. I hope you look at Jordan's story. His story is on our website. It is uh, powerful and it tells you a lot more about Jordan than, than I can. But I hope you look at the website. I hope you take a look at his story. And I hope that our love reaches you. Thank you so much, Joy. That was so beautiful. Um, and I know I've seen your name forever. So it's so <laughs> wonderful to put a face to a name. I know you've been very supportive of everything that I've been doing. Um, and there's been a lot of people asking about the app. So please do put the, yes. put the link in there. Um, and I just, I appreciate you so much. And, you know, as caregivers, you know, like, you will never fully understand what survivors go through. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to remind survivors that you don't know what your caregivers go through. Like sometimes people get so frustrated at their caregivers and the loved ones in their life, but it's like their life has changed as well. And sometimes we just need to take a moment to acknowledge that because not only when was your son's life completely changed, but so is yours um, yeah. and everyone else in your family. Um, so yeah. it's sometimes we need to put that into perspective. It's not just us that's been affected <laughs> by this. That's true. And the app does support both caregivers and members, which is pretty cool. We have an awesome new feature coming out the end of the month, Amy, that I'm super excited about. It's the extended community support. So I will, uh, I will keep you posted as soon as that's available, but I think it's something that caregivers alike, as well as members, will be able to find support. Well, thank you so much, Joy, for everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak, and you have a wonderful and fabulous birthday. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, that was so wonderful. Thank you, Joy. Our next presenter is Lynn Jillian, and she is from Boston, Massachusetts, a wonderful survivor. Um, I've known Lynn for several years as well, Boston Marathon bombing survivor. So welcome, Lynn. You're muted, hon. <laughs> There you go. We start out every meeting that way. <laughs> right. Has, and today is <laughs> nobody has to be told you're muted. I was so careful about being muted because I didn't want to interrupt any of the great things going on. Uh, my name is Lynn Julian, and I am a resilient speaker and survivor of brain injury several times over. I think my first brain injuries uh, back then, you just didn't diagnose things. I assumed they were car accidents growing up, college, things that you get whiplash. And we were never told back then, decades ago, that whiplash was brain injury of some sort. It was concussion. And then I even, I had a major stage accident. I was a professional musician for many years. And passed like knocked myself out hitting the stage and I still was not diagnosed with brain injury I was taken right to the ER and they x-rayed me and told me you're lucky you didn't break a bone because that's the worst thing that could have happened to you can you imagine medical professionals at an ER telling you a broken bone is the worst thing that could happen to you told me I feel better in four weeks and of course I waited and waited and nothing happened um, I did eventually, after years of what we all go through, uh, ocular therapy, speech, uh, uh, vestibular therapy for balance, ocular for your eyes, uh, just therapy after therapy after therapy, I went from wheelchair to walking again and got rid of my cane in 2012, and I was so proud to be walking without a cane, but we all know that recovery is not a straight line. It's mountains, sometimes hills, sometimes mountains. Right now, I am a COVID long hauler and it feels like a mountain. It feels like I took a big dip down in my recovery. And part of being resilient, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today, is the secrets to resiliency. It's not about 
how low you fall or how many times you fall. It's about getting back up. It's always about getting back up. And we just have to keep forgiving ourselves and remembering it's not a straight line. Recovery is not a straight line. I did not fail. I did not even have a setback. I am still recovering. It's a very difficult concept. Well, after I started walking without the cane in the summer of 2012, mere months later, the Boston Marathon attack happens and I end up with another brain injury, undiagnosed yet again. That was 4-15-2013. And that was from blast forced trauma, something I'd never even heard of. And apparently none of the medical professionals in Boston had either because I didn't get diagnosed. And I went into a second hospital a week after the attack and they were much more informed than the first and were very upset that the first hadn't done a CT scan. This is what you get after brain injury. Uh, they said I had all the classic signs of brain injury. I the way I was speaking, the way I was walking, the way I was thinking in fog and unable to find words. I was hearing underwater, they, just all kinds of classic mood swings and crying, all kinds of classic brain injury signs. I would just swing back and forth from angry to upset to angry to upset. And we're here to talk about how I went from wheelchair to walking and eventually running the Boston Marathon and finishing it when I had just barely learned to walk. It's the seven C's of resilience, because this isn't about me. It's about the C's. And the first C is comp comp competence. Sure, I can speak. Competence. People must be seen and encouraged when they do something right. How many of us do that, even for ourselves? Instead of constantly focusing on what you forgot, what you let go, what you dropped, we, we never forget to scold ourselves for that. I could have, I should have, I would have. But do we celebrate when we've done something right? Do we celebrate when we have a small win? We sweat the small stuff, but we need to celebrate the small stuff too in order to keep our brain back in balance. We must celebrate our competence. Even if it's not where we might want it to be, it's here. You need to celebrate that in order to get it to there. The first C, competence. Confidence, you, your belief in your own ability and you develop it by pushing yourself to expand your abilities. And you may think my ability used to be over here. It was off the charts. Okay, you need to learn to love the new you. Maybe the new you is starting here and maybe the new you can get there someday. Maybe you won't, but you're here now. So that's where your confidence has to build from to go up. If you had to relearn to eat, relearn to speak, relearn to brush your teeth without dropping the toothbrush, that's okay. You, instead of just beating yourself up every time you drop the toothbrush, which probably did anyway, confidence. That first time you didn't drop the toothbrush, did you celebrate? That first time you got the food to your mouth and no peas fell off, do not serve people who just had brain injuries, tiny roly-poly vegetables. That's a side note. The first time you get the food in your mouth and nothing spills, celebrate. Every time it spilled, didn't you get angry? Didn't you, ber you know, berate yourself? Don't do that. If you weren't doing it already, don't start. But celebrate when you got it right. That's confidence. So we've got confidence, confidence, connection. That's what we're doing right now. That's what Amy Zelmer helped us create with Not Invisible for Brain Injury Awareness Day. Thanks, Amy. Find your people. Find connection like the TBI tribe, find support groups, find family members, find friends who can be your connections, who do not judge you, who accept you, the new you, as you are. We all know that brain injury can be, oh, what's a good word? It's, it's up and it's down. I'm talking to you fine right now, but by the end of today, I could have a migraine. I could be stuttering, slurring my words. We don't know. So we have to forgive ourselves, love our new body, and accept that we cannot control 
every single thing about our body, but controls later. That's another C. We're getting there. Confidence. Confidence. Connection. Character. That's the fourth C. We all build character. We make choices. We know right from wrong. But now our ability to make these correct choices, the best choices for us, is the frontal lobe, which is where the most brain injuries occur. That's why teenagers don't make the right choices all the time because the frontal lobe is the last to develop and it's not fully developed till 25. So character has changed and you need to be aware of that and forgive yourself. Contribution. Contribution is a big part of the feel good. People say they're, they're being charitable and, uh, and they are, but at the same time, does it make you feel good? Then it's, I don't look at it as charity. I look at it almost like a gift for them, for me, because I feel good about myself when I do it. So charity helps you with contribution to have a sense of purpose and feel good about yourself. Coping. We all need coping strategies. And we've talked a lot about those today, so I'm not going to go too far into them. But don't just get upset. Get help and get coping strategies. I'm trying to wrap it up quickly. Control. When we realize that we can control our decisions, we can control our actions. We may not be able to control our body or our brain at this point, 100% of the time, but we can control the choices that we make. And, and maybe your parents said this a lot, make good choices. We can control our choices. And the more that you make choices that are good for you, you good for your health, putting your mental and physical health first, the more that you're going to build your connections and your confidence and your confidence and your coping skills and everything else. I think control should come first in the list. So the seven Z's are confidence, confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, and control. And that's seven. These are life skills for the whole world, not just people with brain injury. But I think once the brain has been affected, it affects all the senses, the, the five senses and I believe six senses, it affects everything. Uh, I can't imagine people saying that any other injury affects more of the body than brain injury. Uh, my name's Lynn Julian. I speak about resilience. I think with COVID, this is what we need more than ever now. And I contributed to a book called Chronically Empowered, as well as to Amy's book uh, for TBI survivors and check them both out. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for those seven C's. Those were wonderful. Um, I appreciate you. And thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. All right, next up, we have another commercial um, from Green Compass and Jessica Brown. So I will let Andy get that queued up. I'm Jessica Brown, TBI survivor and Green Compass CBD advocate. After sustaining my brain injury, I was suffering from terrible headaches, muscle joint pain, insomnia, and anxiety. When I started using CBD, all of those ailments became more manageable. It's helping me wean off a harmful prescription, and I rarely even use ibuprofen for pain anymore. CBD is one of the most talked about health and wellness products on the market today. With so much confusing information out there, it can be overwhelming and hard to separate the help from the hype. Add to that confusion the fact that CBD is an unregulated substance, which means sadly there is a lot of false advertising and fake products everywhere. That's why I'm here to help you navigate the CBD road. All new customers get $10 off their first order, and we offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. To learn more, contact me via loveyourbraincbd on Instagram, at gmail for email, or .com for product website. Again, that's loveyourbraincbd. All right, so that brings us to our next presenter, Jessica Brown. And she is a fellow brain injury survivor. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, thank you so much, Amy, and happy birthday. Thank you. I have learned so much from the content that you have shared and um, on all your platforms. And it's just an honor to be here today to share my concussion story. 
In 2017, I was 40 years old and felt like I was at the top of my game professionally in medical sales. Ironically enough, promoting concussion prevention and rehab services, specifically in the workers' compensation industry. I, was, I felt like I was a leader in my field and in my community also. I was also top of my game athletically as an Ironman triathlete. When in April of 2017, I was in a car accident at work where I sustained a concussion and had been living with PCS and dysautonomia for five years now. I was fortunate enough not to have a super traumatic incident that landed me in the hospital, the kind that most of society tends to think of when they hear the words brain injury. I actually got out of my totaled car without even a scratch on me and I went right back to work. My symptoms were delayed onset. I was unfortunate in the sense that I still needed, that I still ended up having very complex malfunctioning happening in my brain to an extent that myself and no one else realized. So I kept on going about life and not getting adequate rest or rehab. I only took a very short amount of time off of work once it was realized that I had a concussion. And I still continued participating in online classes during the time that I was off of work. When I returned to work, it was on a part-time basis where while my hours were reduced as a salaried employee in a role where 13 facilities outcomes relied on my performance, my responsibilities and metrics were not decreased. So essentially then, so I was essentially then attempting to do my previous 40 plus hours a week of work in less than half the time with a brain injury. Living and working like that for nine months only made my condition worse. And at that point, when I could not return to work full time, I was let go from my position. When losing, which losing my career only added to my fears and anxieties, further escalating my symptoms. At that point, I was still continuing to fake my way through life. No idea the true extent of my injuries. I see now that I was in denial that first year. Then I had to fully take on the TBI as an identity to process it and accept it. That helped me to learn all that I could. I had to be my own self advocate to navigate through the workers' compensation and the disability and the healthcare systems. Now I focus more on being me while also promoting TBI education and awareness when and where I can. I will always be an Iron Man. That is a title I earned and something that can never be taken away from me. Just because I can't physically do one now doesn't mean I haven't done it and I still have the mental strength required inside of me. Reminding myself the things I accomplished in the past gives me the fuel to fight. And I try not to let myself get discouraged that I can't do them now. This happened as a result of a recent breakthrough. I had a very false belief that if I could exercise again like I used to, I'd get better. When in reality, I was only making things worse, mentally and physically. I was constantly causing setbacks because as an endurance athlete for years, I had trained my brain to ignore pain. I was my own worst enemy. Now I'm grateful and enjoying the fact that I can get outside and walk jog a couple of miles a few times a week, maintaining basic cardio health. Are there other people that had more severe injuries than me that are now able to do more than me physically? Yes, but I'm not other people and other people aren't me. We are each on our own path with different recovery stories and abilities, and we can't compare ourselves to anyone else. My struggles now include sensory overload, extreme neuro fatigue, inability to multitask, headaches, word finding, and many memory problems. I think most of us here are pretty familiar with this list of struggles, emotional struggles. This is its own book, right? I experienced joy and sorrow at the same time. That is confusing. I struggled a lot of, I struggled, I suffered a lot of big regrets and grief over my losses. Working the way I did for those nine months post-accident is one regret. I often wondered, had I taken a different recovery path, might I still have my career? Close friends and family remind me now that I wasn't truly happy doing what I was doing previously. But when the injury happened and all of a sudden that was taken away from me, all I wanted was to have it back. But putting too much energy into regretting what I did or didn't do was not serving me. In retrospect, being let go from my job was a blessing as I was finally able to allow my brain time to heal. I am choosing joy over the sorrow. 
Dr. Leaf says that when it comes to grief, time does not heal. It just creates more space. That space helps you gain a new perspective. And I have found this to be very true. And just like brain healing, grief healing is definitely not linear. I have always valued self-care, but what that looked like before is different than it is now. It involves not only massages and bubble baths, but also mindfulness, meditation, taking breaks where I didn't used to need to, maintaining order and peace in my space, not having my schedule disrupted, giving myself space, grace to slow down and practicing gratitude. I'd like to share some of the things that have helped. I definitely needed to find a constructive way to express what was inside or the anger would eat me alive. Previously, that was through extreme running and exercise. Not being able to do that anymore just amplified the anger. I had practiced yoga before. I was physically strong, but I wasn't utilizing yoga for its truly intended purpose. Once I became physically limited, my time on the mat changed. I began to use the poses, movements, and breathing as a way to process some anger and anxiety. Being a person of faith, this also became a special time of prayer and connection for me. I can tell when I don't intentionally spend time devoted to yoga or in nature, those dark and unpleasant feelings can build up inside of me. I am also a self-help junkie. Filling my mind with positive content is like watering a garden for goodness to grow inside of me. I was running so hard and just spinning my wheels in my previous life. My work wasn't purpose-driven or heart-set and was leading to burnout. We live in a world where that's what's expected, to be grinding all the time. But when you stop grinding, as my TBI forced me to do, you can get into a state of flow where you accomplish more by doing less. And when you find that flow, you don't feel as beat up by the daily roadblocks. So I encourage you to invest in yourself. There is so much personal development material available, a lot of it for free. And I'm more than happy to share a list of some of my favorites. I can put that in the chat later, maybe. When I made an identity and mindset shift, I also came to learn that my career was only what I did, not who I am. My injury was a catalyst that threw me into really who I am instead of who I was conditioned to be. Something I think isn't talked about enough in TBI is the fear of recovery. It's easy to get lost in the cocoon of where you're at and getting better is scary. The pressure of what am I gonna do or what am I gonna be when I'm able to can be overwhelming especially in a situation like mine where I no longer have my career to return to and feel like I have to start all over again. But it's an opportunity to build a new way of life. Different is scary, but we have to remember that different can be better. Just like Kintsugi. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold. Using this as a metaphor for healing ourselves teaches us an important lesson. Sometimes in the process of repairing things that have broken, we actually create something more unique, beautiful, and resilient. I have begun my return to, work pro return to work process in a couple of ways. I'm gaining new independence as an Instacart shopper. That's an um, online personal shopping service. It is a great cognitive exercise to navigate the stores and utilize critical thinking skills again, but with the flexibility to do it on my own schedule when I feel good. I also turned my personal discoveries and knowledge in health and wellness into a way to help other people. Making a decision to start an online CBD business came with challenges of overcoming the, stigma, the stigmas attached to hemp and direct marketing. I'm not letting fear stop me from doing something that could potentially be great for me and for others. I feel a passionate need to share this knowledge as it has helped me so much and it's a great opportunity for me since I'm not able to hold a scheduled job. What do I wanna do next? I'm still trying to figure that out and I have some great ideas. Maybe one day I'll write a book. Maybe I'll go back to school. The pieces of the puzzles are beginning to form a picture for me based on the desires of my heart. I wasn't meant to be living the life that I was. Do I still have fear of the uncertainty of my future and my health and finances at times? Yes, I think that's normal for anyone in life. 
but I'm not going to let worry for tomorrow rob me of today's joy. Instead of stressing or obsessing about it, I'm embracing this time in the waiting and learning what I can while I'm here. I wanna thank everyone who has shown up today to learn and share. It's great to have this community. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jessica, so much for sharing. And um, I do encourage you, go ahead and put in the, um, the chat the the link to your cbd site um, for anyone that might be interested i know cbd was huge for me um particularly for sleep um i was skeptical uh and you know the first night i tried it i slept like a rock and i was like oh is that just coincidence um but then i continued using it and it it not only helps me sleep, but then it also helps with all the inflammation that's going on in our body, which keeps us in a perpetual brain fog. So, right. right. Thank you for sharing that. There's so many things that can help with, with the stress, anxiety too, and the headaches and sleep is a big thing. And for sometimes um, it's great that you had an immediate response. Some people it can take a little while too, but I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody about um, how it could be helpful for them. And I will definitely share my link about it in the chat there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. All right. And our next presenter is Craig Phillips, and he is from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and I'm so happy to have you here, Craig. And you're yeah. muted. Amy, thank there you, you so go. much for the opportunity to share today. This is awesome. Um, uh, my, my topic is neuroplasticity, setting goals, and creating hope after brain injury and stroke. Um, I have been a uh, student of the martial arts for the past 26 years. And uh, when I first started training at the, uh, at the martial arts school where I trained at, my sensei and I had a conversation and he said, what I do is I provide you with ingredients and what your job is to combine those together to become a black belt. And that's what I did with my uh, journey as a martial artist. You know, he, his, um, his instructor's original instructor was Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee had a philosophy of Jeet Kune Do, and his philosophy was to research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add specifically your own creation. And a quote by Albert Einstein that I really like that I think is really important, I think, for you know, us to remember is, is that he says, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish, by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Again, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its life, whole life believing that it is stupid. And one other quote by him is, he says, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. Well, my name is Craig Phillips, and I'm the author and creator of Second Chance to Live, secondchancetolive.org. And what I believe, I believe the recovery process for any of us, those including uh, people with living with brain injuries and strokes, as well as in general, is that we involve both our mind, body, soul, spirit, and emotions. And what I've done is I put together seven, seven series, and this is the third part of the series of presentations that I've had the opportunity to speak about around the country um, through Zoom over the past 20, um, Two months, I've had 70 opportunities to speak around the country. So uh, what today's presentation on neuroplasticity, because this normally is about a 45 minute presentation, I'm going to try to distill down as much as I can into this uh, eight to 10 minute um, uh, time slot. So what I'll do is I, I I'm just going to read some things and then elaborate on them. So after a brain injury or stroke, you know, what was once familiar now becomes unfamiliar. As a result, we could become discouraged. You know, we could find ourselves focusing on symptoms, not on solutions. We may lose hopes and dreams. And with a brain injury and a stroke, what happens is that nerve cells die or are damaged. And around those nerve cells that have been damaged or have died, there are healthy cells. So I believe that the corpus callosum, which is between the right and left, left hemisphere, what it does is it communicates to the right and the left side of our brain. So through repetitive mirror movements, I, I have found through my journey and my process that I've been able to accomplish things that I never dreamed possible. 
So as we do engage in the repetitive mirror movements, what happens is that the, um, what, by using our unaffected side and our affected side at the same time, what happens is, or uh, alternately, we're able to uh, uh, rewire our brain so that our brain is, our left side, uh, my brain was injured, I had an open skull fracture, right for the low gamut, uh, severe brain bruise with brainstem involvement when I was 10 years old in 1967. In May, I will be 65 years old. So, you know, it's never too, uh, it's never too late to start. So what we can do is we can develop new neural pathways and brain reorganization. So um, your brain may have been damaged on the left side, thus you're affecting the right side of your body. You know, something that I need to remember about life in general and such with my brain injuries, accepting my limitations of my brain injury does not mean that I like it. Like it. Accepting them just means that I do not have to be stopped by them. Accepting my limitations gives me the ability to try different approaches. Accepting my limitations gives me the ability to find a way that will work. And I like another quote by Zig Ziglar. He says, that, uh, regardless of your lot in life, you can build something beautiful on it. So then by doing that, by beginning to find ways that will work for us, we no longer have to judge our efforts and our search to find what works for us. And it just takes time. Um, there's a quote by Albert Einstein, I mean, by Tom, um, uh, Thomas Edison. He says that, I've not, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. So what we do through our process is we keep looking for ways that will work in order to be, be able to accomplish the goals that we have for us. And I, I like a riddle, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. So what we need to do is just to decide what we wanna achieve and accomplish in our lives and then go for it a little bit at a time. And. Uh, so I'm free to move beyond what I believe about myself or whether I'm a diet, you know, I mean, many people want me to believe that I, I am my diagnosis, but the great thing about this is I discovered that I don't have to, I don't have to buy into the notion that I'm a diagnosis or prognosis, what other people may be telling me that I could do or accomplish. And I do not have to buy into the notion that I am a label or I do not have to be limited because of a stereotype or a stigmatization or by my own thinking or by the thinking of other people in my life. And that gives me the freedom to search in ways that will work for me. So I can move beyond a diagnosis and a prognosis. I can set, goal, set a goal one step at a time. And through repetitive mirror movements, I'm able to use both sides of my brain and my body. Now, my deficits and my limitations, one of them is that I have a difficult time learning sequences of information. So what I need to do is I need to learn one skill at a time and, uh, you know, uh, to repeat that skill a bazillion times and then learn another skill and do that a bazillion times and then combine those two skills into a skill set. And then I have to repeat the process over and over again. So it's taken me longer to le learn skills and skill sets. But like that quote by Evan Einstein, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. So what I'm going to do is I'll leave in the chat um, the uh, link to my website as well as the link to this presentation if people are interested in getting more of a, uh, an overview. Because I, I have a tendency to be an expansive thinker. And so I realized that about myself too. So, and I don't judge myself because, because of that. So, you know, it's, it's really important to start out slowly, but don't give up. Achieving your goal, don't be discouraged. You know, and, and you know, I like to fable the uh, tortoise and the hare. The, the tortoise, the hare challenged the tortoise to a race and the tortoise laughed at the hare. So they started off on the race and the, Hare went off into the fields and played, lay down, but the hare, I mean, the tortoise kept plugging along. And at the end, he was at the finish line when the uh, hare finally woke up and ran to the finish line. And at the bottom of that fable, the line is slow and steady, 
wins the race. So there may be people in our lives that want to discourage us, that are the hairs in our life to tell us that we can't achieve certain things. But you know, even though it may take us a lot longer than it does other people, we can just work on that goal, whether it be activities of daily living, whether it be uh, learning how to do different tasks around the house or other things. So it's very important just that we, you know, it's really important to run our own race and not to judge our efforts. Because as the fable, the line at the end of the fable is slow and steady wins the race. So we don't compare and that it's really important to have fun with the process. If we don't have fun, if we're not having fun, it's important to go do something else. But just find, find a way that it will work for you. Find a goal that you want to accomplish with your life, one goal at a time. And just whatever skill you work on one side of your brain, on your one side of your body, work on the other side of your body. So eventually you're going to be able to move and do things that you never dreamed possible. Because and you work on gross motor skills and fine motor skills, you work on small muscle groups and fine motor, muscle groups, you know, using, and my primary martial art is Muay Thai, which uses elbows, knees, hands, and feet. So I'm using both sides of my body and all that I do. And then I've also combined uh, Western boxing and um, Jeet Kune Do and Wing Chun and, and uh, Eskrima, which is modern artist and different arts, if you come to my uh, website and you scroll across, you'll see a link called Brain and Body. Click on that and that will show you the different ways that I've used neuroplasticity in my life. And Amy, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and it's really good to be with all of you out there in the listening audience. And I hope you all have a good day. God bless you guys. Thanks Craig, for your thank kindness. You. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Craig, for being here. That You're was welcome. wonderful. Thank you. You're very kind. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Jennifer Byers Chambers, and she is a survivor. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted for a second. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I'm here to talk about how to tell your story. I'm a brain injury survivor, and uh, I'm also a writer. I'm a mom of three. I'm a publisher. I'm a podcaster, and I'm a radio personality. I'm looking forward to my 23rd book coming out this summer. I like books and the outside and making things. Um, I'm telling you this for a reason. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, I sustained a traumatic brain injury when I was 15 in a car accident. And I still can't remember anything before I was 15. Uh, I had to relearn everything from walking and speaking to tying my shoes, like many people listening today. And I also have an extremely rare autoimmune disease, like so rare that the National Institute of Health might name it after me. So that's cool. <laughs> I think you have to have a little fun with it. So the reason why I said that, I, I, it was my short 30 second autobiography. Uh, it was an outline of my life. I wanted to tell you that quickly because it's really important for me to help other people share their stories. Those were the highlights of, of my personal life. Um, as I said, I'm in real life, I'm part owner of a publishing company and we've helped about 1600 people tell their stories in print and, and in other methods over the last 12 years. I think that our stories are powerful and especially as a person who is disabled, you don't hear enough of our stories and our stories matter. Our stories matter to other people, not just us, and we count. So today I invite you to think about the possibility of telling your own life story. And I'm gonna give you some tools to maybe think about that possibility. There are several things I, I talk about when I work with people with memoir writing. Um, those of us with brain injuries or other illnesses have even more specific things that we can talk about. And these specific things help people relate to you. That's one of the big goals of any kind of memoir writing. And also another thing to think about that I ask all my clients to think about at the beginning of our, our sessions together is what kind of question 
do you want to ask and answer when you talk about your own story? Is it how this person survived or how they pushed past their limitations or their life despite the fact that they are disabled in some way? So the way that I, I, I do this with all different kinds of clients um, is <laughs> I do a post-it brainstorm memoir. So using a regular post-it, just like this kind of post-it, get a big stack of post-its. And I want you to take 10 different post-its and stick them on a wall or a mirror somewhere that you can see it. And then you have a visual way for you to, to look at your story and kind of help yourself organize your thoughts in that way. Um, I want you to put two instances from your life on each post-it. So that's 20 different themes, more or less. So for the first one, and don't worry, I have this, I have a link to this on my website. It's all in a PDF form. You don't have to write it down or remember it. But I'm going to go through each theme really quickly here. The first is the path not taken, or the path taken, or the fork in the road a time in your life when something changed. Your second theme is family, those you're born with and those you choose. There's a lot of stories that, um, that you could think about, I'm sure. Uh, the third one is an interesting one. It's money, money business. Whether it's the lack of money or trying to find it or <laughs> if money had impacted you in some way, I, I'm sure you have a story in your life that could illustrate something uh, that you could talk about within that theme. The fourth theme here is to talk about the real work of your life. What's the most important thing for you to do? For me, and I kind of fell into it by accident, I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be a publisher. So the real work of my life is helping other people tell their stories. So what is the real work of your life? What is the thing that really makes your soul feel good? And write about that for your fourth topic. Your fifth topic is kind of a thorny one, but I think it's very, very important. And it's your self-concept or your self-image. Uh, as a person who is not necessarily a slim person, there's a lot to work with there for me. Uh, everybody's got their own issues. But I think also it's the stories you tell yourself about yourself. Uh, that's something that there's, there's a lot of material there within that concept for you to, to write about and then to learn about yourself through. The sixth concept is health. And if you are a person who has a disability um, or a brain injury, um, it's, it's definitely a very rich subject as well. But even people who don't have a large thing in their lives can, can write about how health or lack of being healthy in some way has impacted their lives. The seventh subject is relationships. I have a friend who's a writer in New York and he writes all about he's never found the love of his life. And it's very interesting because his perspective on that is completely different. I was very lucky. Um, I, I found and, and married my husband quite young. So it's completely different from mine. And it's so fascinating to me. So I think you'd be surprised by the, the amount of people who can identify with your story, no matter if it's theirs or not, um, within the relationship sphere. There's all sorts of thorny, thorny relationships. Jimmy Buffett said, we've all got them, we all want them. So <laughs> there's definitely something there to be worked out. The eighth subject is transitions. Transitions are a, a particularly fraught time in your life. Um, for me, I had, of course, the transition from being um, brain injured to being quote unquote better. <laughs> um, my, my transition to healing, my transition through, through learning, relearning my life again, through trying to go to college, through trying to decide if I want to have children, you know, those are really big life choices and decisions that have lots of stories and incredible amounts of material that you can work out and write about. 
Also, if you are a person who is, if you're older and your children have left home, that's a big transition. Um, I'm actually going through that now. My oldest son is 21. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, you can contrast that with having your first child or you can contrast that with how it felt when, when you left home. There, there's lots of different options there. Um, the ninth subject that you can think about is your spirituality or lack of same. Um, you could even talk about both those things. I think that that is an incredibly important part in a lot of people's lives. And there's nothing wrong with talking about that within your work as well. The 10th thing that um, I suggest that people put on their themes is big goals you have. Did you have a big goal? Um, interestingly, uh, I think a lot of people have different goals post injury than they did before. That makes sense. I actually trained to be an opera singer which uh, did not turn out to be my life plan, but <laughs> that my goals changed. And uh, it, it's definitely fun to, to think about where I would be <laughs> and, and how my goals are now. What do you want to do with your life? You can write about things like that. Now, because I've worked with so many people, I hear a lot of pushback. Come on. Andy, has she froze for you too, I assume? Yeah, I'm not getting any more. Uh, yeah, okay. I wasn't sure if it was her or me at first. All right, uh, we'll pivot. Um, looks like she's back oh, on It now. looks like she's back. Okay, let's bring her back in. Sorry about that. No worries. You're, it's the first drop of the day. We're doing good. We're over halfway. <laughs> right on. <laughs> it's funny. I live in a very tiny town in uh, the Northwest. So it, it kind of makes. Oh, no. Maybe we spoke too soon. All right, well, I think we're just gonna move on to our next speaker. Um, oh, she's back again. All right, Jennifer, we'll give it one more try here. You're muted. Oh, there we am go. I working now? Okay, I don't wanna yeah, talk you are. faster. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, so my first thing was your self-doubt. Um, why would anybody want to read what I wrote and who cares who I am? Um, that's super normal. And the truth is that everybody has something important and valid to say. And I can tell you that there's going to be somebody who identifies with it. So um, have faith that your story is important. The second thing that people say to me is that they're um, afraid of what they'll find. It's a very valid fear if you write truths about yourself that maybe you kind of didn't think about for a reason. But, um, you know, I invite you to, to sort of go through it and see what happens. I was really surprised. I wrote my first book about two women with brain injuries using my own personality and a bunch of research that I did. And I was terrified. And it, was, it turned out to be that I learned a lot about myself. Um, the, the third thing that's scary about why you'd write your book is how am I going to sell it? And um, my advice to people is to think about where you want it to go and kind of move backwards from there. There is no reason why you can't write your story for yourself, your family, your loved ones, and for them to understand what it's like to be you. That's really, really important. Uh, my family was very moved when they were able to, he to hear and, and read that. And then I've heard from a lot of other people that it was important for them. So um, give yourself that chance. Uh, another thing people say is I don't know how to promote it. Um, I have free resources on my website for how to do that. And I don't know how to organize it. Um, how would I put it all my life into a book? And I encourage people to go back to your post-it party that you have because that's gold. You can do that again at any time. Take about 10 minutes, go through your stuff, and you'll find little pieces of your life that are important 
and um, interesting to write and read about. Um, some things that I have people keep in mind when they're when they are writing their stories is how when you write a book, think about them as smaller All right, I think we've lost Jennifer again. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, and I'll be sure to get uh, Jennifer's information for everyone, but we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Um, we're gonna move on to Tanika Canacero and she is joining us. She is a survivor joining us from Texas. So Tanika, let's get her. There we go. Welcome. And um, it's such a small world how you and I met. I was taking a uh, yoga, trauma informed yoga teacher training class with like a couple hundred people in it. It was virtual. And the first day they put us into little chat rooms to get to know each other. And there's only like, I think they put four, four or five people in a room. So the odds that we even got in this room together were so small. And like the first thing you said to me was, oh my gosh, I, I'm so glad you're in this room with me. And I was like, who's she talking to? <laughs> and then it turns out that she has a brain injury and she had been following me. So I'm so happy to have you here with us. Yes, thank you so much. I just want to say, you know, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, happy birthday to you. And, you know, it really is a small world because um, Dr. Dina Adams and Patty Foster, um, they host the local support um, group that I attend. So um, it's really, you know, a, a small, small world. Um, so yeah, um, I guess just to get started, um, you know, I'll be talking about um, traumatic brain injuries and how they can impact fertility. Um, but first, I'll give you just a little bit of my story. So a little over five years ago, I fell and I hit my head trying not to step on and squish a one-eyed mini chihuahua who only weighs about three pounds. Um, and so, you know, when this happened, I was burnt out. Um, I was going through a divorce. I was raising three kids, one of which has uh, multiple disabilities. And so the conditions were just really right for me to end up with post-concussion syndrome. Um, and then in, you know, later years, um, all of my kids have had brain injuries themselves. And so not only am I a survivor, I'm also a caregiver. And um, this has really kind of pushed me into what I'm doing now into um, this new career. So today I'm a certified functional nutrition counselor, a health coach, yoga instructor, and personal trainer. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's amazing how one, one thing can change your life forever. Um, so TBIs are just the numbers are staggering how many people end up suffering from them every year. So in 2018 alone, there were 223,050 people approximately just in the US alone who suffered from them. Um, and of that 16, a little over 16,000 were kids. Um, and as far as infertility goes, that is something that is exponentially increasing decade after decade. Um, and so currently there's about 48.5 million people worldwide who um, are suffering from some form of infertility. And that breaks down to being one in eight couples in the US, one in six in Australia and New Zealand, and one in four in the developing world. Um, and it's estimated that 30% is female factor, 30% is male factor, another 30% is combined, and 10% is unknown. Um, and so how, does, how do TBIs and fertility connect? Um, well, it's the HPG axis. I don't know if you guys have heard of the HPA axis. There's a lot of talk about that these days. And that's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and that, you know, in, is involved in fatigue and just our energy levels that we have and hormones. Um, the HPG axis is um, the hypothalamic pituitary um, gonadal 
um, axis. And so really you're looking at your hormones from top to bottom. And so the hypothalamus is an area in the brain that regulates um, things like thirst, hunger, body temperature, sleep. Um, and it's essentially the switchboard of our brains and, and the hormonal system. And so anything that impacts that is going to impact the pituitary. And the pituitary releases things like um, luteinizing hormone or prolactin or follicle stimulating hormone, um, as well as oxytocin um, and, and, and things like that. And then you have your gonads, which are where the more common um, sex hormones are thought of or are produced. So um, things like estrogen, progesterone, um, androgens like testosterone. And um, it is estimated that 25 to 50% of people who have had a brain injury have actually damaged their pituitary gland. Um, you know, again, this is the master hormone gland. And a lot of times we don't know what's going on. You know, all we know is we can't sleep. We, you know, our hormones feel like they're out of whack. Um, and, you know, studies have actually shown that in this case where the pituitary has been impacted, um, it can, there are increased levels of hypopituitary, hypopituitarism um, as, that are associated with post-concussion syndrome. Um, and so, again, it's a whole cascade and everything is connected one with the other. Um, so if you have anything that's impacting any part of that, it's going to be dysfunctional and you're gonna have issues. Some other ways that um, fertility can be impacted by TBIs are having irregular periods, decreased sperm production, overall inflammation, damaged neurons might not even uh, be firing properly to get the signals from one part of the body to the other. Your gut or digestion might be impacted, causing a cascade of other issues, um, which can lead to inflammation and all of these other things, or even um, stress. Um, fatigue, again, um, you know, even things like our, our medications that we're given to try to help with sleep, that can actually negatively impact our fertility and our body's ability to sleep and produce some of these other hormones that we need. Um, our body's always going to pr uh, prioritize survival. So if anything is off, your fertility may be impacted. So until you can get everything else together, um, you might have trouble trying to conceive. And so briefly, how do we fix this? Um, some ways that you can help restore fertility and function to the HPG axis are, first of all, identify what's going on. Um, know your numbers um, with your hormones or anything else that's happening um, and really get in tune with your body I know we had a wonderful mindfulness uh, session earlier. That's an excellent way for you to just try to kind of get into your body, feel what's going on, and then just make some notes. Um, you'll want to really try to address those situations versus just slapping a Band-Aid on the symptoms and um, dialing in on nutrition, uh, life, sorry, lifestyle factors such as nutrition, reducing stress, getting good sleep, um, finding good exercise, uh, that's not too vigorous. Um, and then you also want to look at things like your environment. So what chemicals are in your environment that may be hindering your ability to heal? Um, and that may be kind of kicking things off. Um, you know, and then just surrounding yourself with good, with a great support system, whether that's doctors, therapists, acupuncturists, massage therapists, support groups, um, Amy's got a fantastic group, um, and there's so many others out there. So, um, and then, you know, just finding good professionals that you can work with. So, um, yeah, just in a quick nutshell, that's kind of some ways that TBIs can impact your life that we don't necessarily think about or don't think to connect the dots to, right? I mean, you can hit your brain as a child and be having these issues as an adult. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, you know, talking about the HPA and the HPG access points, um, 
you know, I think it's something we, we maybe hear our doctors mention, maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's great to have somebody just kind of explain it in simple terms and how it can affect us. And, you know, fertility is definitely a real issue after TBI. And so are just hormonal problems in general. Um, I hear so many women, um, and men, it definitely can affect men too. I don't want to exclude them in that, in that, um, topic of hormones. Um, but for women, it can be a little more obvious with, you know, periods that either go away or they get heavier or they're completely irregular. Um, and so, you know, that like, that's not normal. Um, and so don't, you know, keep asking your doctors questions. Don't, don't just take, oh, you're fine (laughs) for an answer, right? (laughs) Keep digging, keep pushing. Don't ever give up and, you know, find people that can be in your corner and help support you and provide you that information and help you advocate for yourself. So, um, you know, that's one of the missions that I have is to, you know, be able to really support people along in their journey, wherever they are, whether they're kids, adults, caregivers, you know, or the person themselves that have, you know, suffered from that, you know, and I try to help you with nutrition through yoga and mindful movement, um, you know, through even strength training and balance. Um, so yeah, just kind of all the way and just kind of providing you with that coaching. Well, Tanika, thank you so much for being here. And I forgot to play your commercial before you came on. So we're going to play your commercial now. Um, I got all flustered with with Jennifer dropping. Um, So thank you again so much for being here today, Tanika. It's just been so great getting to know you. No, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Thank you. Take care. All right. And Andy, I'll let you go ahead and cue that up. Hi there. If you or someone else you know has had a traumatic brain injury, also known as a TBI, or are perhaps living with post-concussion syndrome and experience some of the following, debilitating or constant headaches and fatigue, having brain fog, and feeling just like you can't really think straight or having memory loss, balance issues, mood or behavioral changes such as anxiety or depression, perhaps feeling grief and feeling lost and just like you don't really know what to do with your life now, or having impacts at work, school, or home, or even in your relationships amongst other symptoms? And if doctors have ever told you things like, there is not much you can do besides rest in order to help your brain heal, or that you'll be fine in a week, only to realize that you actually weren't, or that it's all in your head, and that you're making these things up or imagining them, or wherever you are in your recovery after two years is where you'll be for the rest of your life, If so, then you might be interested in what I have to say. My name is Tanika, and I specialize in TBI and helping people recover from traumatic brain injuries and post-concussion syndrome. I am the founder of Allo Holistic Wellness, a certified functional nutrition counselor, health coach, yoga instructor, and personal trainer. But above all, I am a TBI survivor, mother to children who have had brain injuries, and I've made it my mission to help people and families recover from these often life-changing events. If these things resonate with you and you are serious about healing your brain, go ahead and send me an email and let's chat to see if you qualify for Kintsugi TBI recovery. Traumatic brain injuries are a silent epidemic. And according to the CDC, approximately 223,050 people were hospitalized for TBIs in 2018 alone. And of that, just under 20,000 were kids. And while these statistics are alarming, there are countless others who perhaps saw their, their regular doctor, went to urgent care, went to the ER, but who were not admitted, and those who never even sought treatment at all. It's estimated that post-concussion syndrome occurs in 10 to 30% of survivors. Brain injuries do not discriminate, and their effects are often life-changing or even deadly. Your age, gender, ethnicity, income bracket, None of that makes a difference in who ends up suffering from them. As parents, caregivers, and survivors who may also be parents, it can be hard to know what to do or where to turn for help and guidance. If you're truly serious and you'd like some support and guidance on this journey that you or your loved one are on, I'd love to chat with you. Just go ahead and send me an email at nourish at alloholisticwellness.com. That's nourish at aloholisticwellness.com. 
I know oftentimes these things seem insurmountable, but we are walking miracles. And I do have some good news. There are some very effective ways to naturally heal your brain, allowing for improved quality of life, the ability to regain skills and abilities hindered or lost, and an improved sense of self. If you are truthfully and honestly serious about going from fatigued, headache ridden, lacking direction and confidence and struggling with the inability to live the life that you desire and ready to move towards a life where you have more energy, increased productivity, better sleep, increased confidence and direction, regain that independence and have the ability to live the life that you've imagined, then go ahead and shoot me an email at nourish at allholisticwellness.com. I'd be happy to chat with you to see if you're a candidate for helping you recover naturally from your brain injury or post-concussion syndrome. I need to go make a brain shake for one of my kids now, but I do look forward to talking with you soon. Bye. All right. Okay. So our next speaker, we have Jim Davis, the survivor from Colorado. So Jim, go ahead and turn your camera on, please. Jim, are you there? There he is. All right, so Jim is our next presenter coming to us from Colorado. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you very much. I'm kind of a strange person. I sent you a video. I didn't know whether you got it. It was about eight minutes, but it's okay. I'm gonna talk now. I am a survivor I, of a brain injury. I've had a great life. I've had many different professions. All of them have been very productive. When I was 58 years of age, I had bought a brand new Harley Davidson, paid cash for it. Two years later, or one year later, I had a bad accident that I caused myself. We lived at almost 9,000 feet above sea level in the Rocky Mountains. I asked my adopted daughter if we could go for a ride that day. This is in January. She says, Dad, she says, I'm going to a movie with mom. I said, that's okay. I went out for a ride, caused my own accident. The accident, I stopped breathing four times, or my heart stopped four times before they got me to the hospital. I got to the hospital in Denver and it went on for nine months. I was there. My insurance company hates me because it costs them over seven figures to the left of the decimal to take care of me. Anyway, a couple, two years later, I couldn't work anymore. So I've been retired for 22 years now, but I'm not tired. I keep doing different things. And my latest one is, an, it's a website called jesusparenting.com. Now I'm going into parenting now with our kids. And we have my boss, you understand what I'm saying? My boss of 56 years now, we had four by birth, couldn't have any more, and we knew it. We went into foster care, we had over 26 months to a year. We adopted three. One is Oriental, she's from Taiwan. One is Black, he's from Africa, and one is a honky like us. All of them are doing incredibly well, but a lot of that, the brain injury caused me a lot of things. I had to change everything because obviously I had to retire. It put me into chapter seven, which is bankruptcy. It stays on your credit report for 10, or, yeah, 10 years. So I knew that I had to change a lot of things, but I investigate things pretty good. I find out what's legal, what's moral, what's ethical. In less than two years, even though it was on my credit report for the next eight years, we were able to buy two houses, each of them with a 30 year mortgage. My daughter calls me up two years later, a year and a half later. She says, dad, when are you gonna sell the houses? What house you want me to sell? She says, you need to sell the house you're living in. 
I said, what's going to happen to mom and dad? She says, you're going to come and live with us. I said, wow. Short story is we sold the house. We live with her. You're, you're seeing me in our living room kitchen right now. This house has 6,000 square feet of space. And we have our own living room, our own bedroom, our own bathroom. And my daughter says, dad, you keep that door shut. I said, wait a minute. The kids want to see us every day, maybe two, three times. She says, that's okay. You keep the door shut. I said, why do we have to keep the door shut? She says, dad, she says, we're trying, my husband and I are trying to teach the kids how to have respect and honor for the seniors, for the elders. I said, okay, Jim, you're in your 70s. So now your daughter has become the parent and you are the dad. And you can't see it right now, but over on my left, you can, there's a picture over there of my grandchildren. But I have another saying that's over there. If we'd have known grandchildren were so great, we would have started there first. So anyway, with brain injury, it does affect you an awful lot, but I've had a lot of pleasures just because of the brain injury. I have today a journal with over 300 cards that were sent to me when I was in the hospital over 20 years ago. That is medicine. You never know, caregivers don't know the strength of the medicine that they're giving to the care receiver. And I am a, hopefully now I'm a caregiver, but I am a care receiver of a lot of people. I could keep talking about that. And repetition is a jewel that each one of us have to have or should keep repeating the good stuff, not the negative. We have to recognize the negative and do the good. I have one saying I'm gonna leave you with, I'm, I know I might be a little bit short, but one of my new domain names is jesusparenting.com. On there, there's over 20 articles that I've written. They're all free. I don't charge anything. I don't sell anything. And it's all about the man who was also God named Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Cry, or thank you, Jim, so much. Uh, okay. Thank you for being here. You bet. All right. Next, uh, you guys get me. We are going to do a little bit of yoga. And I want you all to just take a moment and situate yourself. You can stay in your chair, um, but back your chair up away from the computer just a little bit so that you're not right at your desk or wherever you're listening. And move to the front two thirds of your chair so you're not leaning back into it. And bring your feet flat on the floor in front of you. Now go ahead and make sure you pull those shoulder blades back and down so you're sitting up nice and tall. And pull your chin back just a little, especially if you've been sitting at the computer all day. You're probably pronating forward a little bit. I'm going to switch to my AirPods here for a moment. I'm going to, I switched to my AirPods so now I can move back a little bit. Uh oh. All right, so sitting with your feet flat on the floor, your shoulder blades are pulled back and down. You've pulled your chin and head back just a little bit. Now go ahead and let your eyes just close or you can just soften your gaze on the floor in front of you. And just breathe, just be present and still for a moment.
Now take a long inhale, a long exhale. And again, a long inhale, a long exhale. Go ahead and open your eyes. And let's take a big collective breath together as a group. So inhale, lifting your arms, palms up overhead. Exhale, palms down, letting your arms float back down. Let's do one more like that. Inhale. If this is hard on your shoulders, you can just come to cactus arms instead of all the way up overhead. Exhale, release your arms down. Go ahead and do some big shoulder rolls. Really move those shoulders up, back, and down. Waking up the scapula and the clavicles. And then go the opposite direction, up, forward, and around. And then coming back to neutral. And bring your left arm across your body, holding it up with your right for support. Stretching out those deltoids through your shoulders. And release and bring your right arm across and hold it with your left. And release. And now take both your hands and do some big wrist rolls. And go the opposite direction. And then release your hands back to your lap. Now let's do some lateral bends. So you're gonna bring up your right hand like you're saying hi. And as you inhale, we're gonna bend to the left, reaching that right arm over and exhale back to center. And again, inhale to the left, exhale to center. One more, inhale and exhale. Now we're gonna switch hands, bring up that left hand. And we're gonna inhale as we bend to the right. Exhale to center. Inhale. And if that's hard on your shoulder, you don't have to move the arm. You can kind of leave it at a cactus angle. And inhale one more time to the right. And back to center. Now bring your left hand to your right knee. Inhale, nice and tall through that spine. And as you exhale, we're gonna twist to the right. You can use the back of your chair to help you get into a deeper twist. And take a few breaths here, waking up our spine. And on your next exhale, come back to center. And then bring your right hand to your left knee. Inhale, nice and tall. And exhale as you twist to the left. And breathe here. And on your next exhale, back to center. And then bring both hands to both knees. And we're gonna do a few seated cat cows. So inhale as you pull those shoulder blades back together, broaden through your chest. And as you exhale, back into cat. Inhale, cow. Inhale, cow. Exhale, cat. 
One more inhale, cow. And exhale, cat. And now hold this one here and just give those hips a little wiggle, loosening up your low back. And then coming back up to center. Now we'll do some happy hip circles. So let's bring our hands on our hips. And as we inhale, we're gonna start to the right and inhale as we circle around the front. Exhale as you circle around the back. Inhale around the front. Exhale around the back. One more inhale. And exhale. And coming back to center. And we're going to do the same thing, but leading to the left. So inhales, we go to the left and around the front. Exhale around the back. Inhale around the front. Exhale around the back. And one more inhale around the front. Exhale around the back. And coming back to center. Again, sitting up nice and tall. All through your spine. Tucking your chin back just. And then turn them thumbs down. And bring your right hand across your left. Interlace the fingers. And bring your hands through. And then cross your left foot over your right foot on the floor. And again, sitting up nice and tall. This is a very calming pose for your central nervous system. This is a great pose to do if you're feeling anxious or nervous. It can really help calm and center you. We're crossing the midline, both on top and on the bottom. If you have body tremors, you might notice that they stop when you do this pose. Take another big breath in. And then your feet the other way. We have to for your right. One for your left. Checking in with your sit bones. Just feeling the stillness and the calmness in your body. Take a big inhale. Release the hands and release the feet. Now bring both hands in front of you, palms up, like you're holding a platter. And as you inhale, allow your right or your left arm to cross to the right, like you're offering to your neighbor. And the exhale, bringing that hand back. Inhales, you take your right arm to your left, offering to your neighbor. Exhale, release. Inhale, left arm to the right. And release. 
Inhale, right arm to the left. Exhale, release. Now as we inhale, let's bring that ball of energy up and above, offering it to the heavens. And as you exhale, allow it to rain down on you. Now I have one more I want to do with you and I invite you to stand if you're able. If you need to stay in the chair, you can continue to do it here. But if you can, I encourage you to stand, get up out of your chair, bringing your feet hip width apart, about two fists width apart and getting strong through your feet, shoulders back and down. And then we're just gonna bounce, gently bending the knees and the elbows. Bounce. This is another great exercise to bring calmness to your body, taking you out of fight or flight, bringing you into rest and digest. Now go ahead and slowly let those arms begin to bounce up. If you have sore shoulders, you can stay here at cactus or you can continue bouncing overhead if you can and continue bouncing those knees. This is draining our lymphatic system. And slowly bounce the arms back down. Now on your bounce, try to lift your heel with each bounce helping to build proprioception and ankle strength. And letting the, the heels come back down, continuing to bounce. And slowly coming to stillness. Now take your feet wider, but shoulder width apart. And we're gonna make little fists with our hands. We're just gonna close our hands hand and our thumb on the outside, just a really loose fist. We're not clenching it. We're just lightly holding it. And we're going to do some swinging twists. So keeping your head looking straight forward, allowing your entire torso to move, not just swinging from the shoulders. And the hands are going to tap on your low back and on your abdomen as you twist. And keeping that head forward should keep you from having any dizziness. This is waking up your kidneys and your adrenals and your bladder system. Now, as you twist, take that front hand and we're gonna tap our clavicle, which is right where your breastbone meets your clavicle. So the back hand continues to tap your low back and the front hand taps your clavicle. This is waking up your lungs, your respiratory system. And then allow your hands to come back down to your abdomen and your low back. And then very gently coming back to stillness. And one last, bring your feet back together. Hands at your side. Pull your shoulder blades back and down. Engaging all the muscles in your body slightly externally rotating your shoulders so your palms face forward, pulling your chin and head back just a little, feeling those shoulder blades pull together, engaging those glutes and the quads, and feel the strength in your mountain pose. And I invite you to close your eyes or gently soften your gaze in front of you. And take a few breaths here. 
If you're in a chair, same thing, grounding your feet into the earth and sitting up tall through your spine, feeling the strength in your body. And gently opening your eyes. And let's take two final breaths together. Inhale, palms up, arms overhead, or to cactus. Exhale, release, palms down. And one more, inhale. And exhale. And then go ahead and just give everything a little shake, a little bit more movement into your body. And then go ahead and come back to your chair. I hope that you enjoyed your 15 minutes of yoga. And that's really how gentle and easy my yoga classes are. People have this misconception that you have to be super flexible and bendy uh, to be able to do yoga. And that's simply not true. You can stay in your chair the entire time if you need to. All right. Okay, up next we have a commercial. Um, just another big thank you to our major sponsor, Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. And we're gonna show Dr. Shane Stedman's commercial again. And I will let Andy get that queued up for us. Yeah. Hey everybody, Dr. Shane Stedman here with Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. We specialize in brain-based rehabilitation for those who have suffered from a concussion or traumatic brain injury. What sets us apart from other clinics is that we combine the aspects of functional medicine and functional neurology to come up with an individualized, customized treatment plan for those who have suffered from a traumatic brain injury. If you or someone you know has suffered from a TBI, let them know that we can help. We offer a free 30-minute consultation to find out whether or not we would be a good fit for you. You can either go to our website at integratedbraincenters.com or you can call 303-781-5617 and schedule your free consultation now to find out if we would be a great fit. Okay, and so our next speaker is Derek O'Neill, and Derek O'Neill is a survivor from Alexandria, Virginia, um, and I have met Derek several times when I've been out to Washington, D.C. for Brain Dream Awareness Day, so welcome, Derek. Thank you. Can, can you hear me okay? I can. Let me get you in here. There we go. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to be able to share my story with everyone, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Derek O'Neill, and I am a survivor. Oh, by the way, uh, from the standpoint of things I've done in the past that may be of interest, um, I moved to Virginia in 2003 from Michigan. Uh, when, while I was in Michigan, uh, which is where my brain injury occurred, I was on the Michigan Brain Injury Association Board. I was a board member of the Brain Injury Association of Michigan for six years. And then I moved to Virginia and uh, the word got out. Someone would call and let Virginia know that I was available. So I, be, I joined the board of the Brain Injury Association of Virginia and I did two consecutive terms on that. So I look forward to being able to share my information and to share my story. And here's how my story begins. Um, I am a veteran. I was born in New York City, New York. Uh, as, or the way I put it is New York, New York, the city so nice, they named it twice. I also uh, went to uh, school in money-making Manhattan and very, very proud of that. And later on, I'll tell you and share with you the fact that I'm married to my high school sweetheart. And that's a good thing as well. So once again, that's the beginning of my story. My accident happened on June 7th, 2004. 
I was driving home from work at the time. I was an executive working for a holding group uh, that belonged to Johnson Controls. And what we did is we built seats for the Cadillac Coupe de Ville. And I had just returned from a trip to Korea. And on my way home, uh, they tell me this because I don't remember this. A deer jumped onto the highway. And unfortunately, I hit the deer. And because of the fact that I was injured, uh, it, well, because of that accident, I suffered a brain injury. Now, uh, it was a, a cerebral hematoma. I needed to have uh, three brain surgeries to be uh, completely, uh, you know, helped in my accident. And the, and the situation for me was when I had my accident, um, they didn't even know who I was because I had my wallet in my, my glove compartment. So for a while, I was John Doe. I was John Doe for about three days. But then they did find my wallet and they were able to call my father, who passed, the, who was able to have them call my wife. And she came in and, 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 you know, got involved in my recovery. I recovered in, in Michigan and it was at the, the hospital where I had my surgery. And interestingly enough, I was comatose for three months before I came out of my coma. So it was very, very tough for me. And interestingly enough, part of my background is that I'm a retired military officer. I was an officer during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And while, when I came out of my coma, I actually believed that part of my accident was because of a military situation. So I thought maybe something had happened to me and I, and I still was in the army. Fortunately for me, my doctor who, who took care of me while I was coming out of my coma and recovering was also a former military person. So he would respond and refer to himself in military terminology, which made me feel more comfortable. So, you know, he would, you know, call me you know, Major O'Neill and things like that, and I would respond to that. Something else that happened that is very interesting to me is that this uh, beautiful woman came to talk to me while I was uh, recovering. And I had a really, really nice conversation because even though I suffered a brain injury, I was able to talk and as if, you know, everything was okay. But the fact of the matter is I wasn't okay. But I had a beautiful conversation with this woman. And when she left, I was so happy that I had a chance to talk with her. She, um, I was told that she uh, was uh, my wife. I was like, wow, she's my wife? They said, yeah, she's your wife. I said, wow, you know, uh, uh, I don't remember, you know, all the, a lot of things. I, I don't remember at all. But the fact of the matter is, if, if I had a wife like this, I must have been pretty, pretty, a pretty good guy. So I'm pretty happy about that. So as we moved on, and, I, and during my recovery, telling you about me being a you know, former POW, I also remember something very interesting. It was loving to sing because uh, during my therapy at the uh, at Brain Injury Association of Michigan, uh, they had music therapy. And that was really, really good for me. I really enjoyed it and made me happy. And I used the music therapy to help me with my memory. So uh, what it did for me was that I, I could easily put things in verse or in turn or in tune and that helped me with my memory very much. I remember struggling to make sense of who I was. And once again, you know, that music part of it made me a happier person and, and I, I helped, my, helped my recovery immensely. So I would just, uh, you know, listen to a tune and then start singing the words. And the, the more I sang, the more I remembered. So once again, um, I thought that, you know, I, I went through my recovery process and one of the things I found out about music is music uh, helps your, promotes your vocalization, uh, your rhythmic movements, your orientation, your relaxation, your self-expression. And uh, that really, really did a lot to help me with my recovery. So the bottom line now is that uh, what I do now is I, I do a lot of volunteering because unfortunately, when I lost my position, I was the vice president of a company. Uh, not being able to really understand the nature of brain injury, it was pretty scary to that particular organization. So I didn't, I did, I was not able to keep that position. And unfortunately for me, when I joined that position as the vice president, I had just taken, I had taken a buyout from my former position where I was a general manager. So therefore, I didn't have enough tenure with the new company to be able to move forward. So. I started learning how to be comfortable with myself being a person who volunteered. And I, so I found some good places to volunteer. And one of the places I volunteer at now is a Nova Hospital in, in Alexandria, Virginia. 
And, uh, and there, you know, I'm an intake representative. And one of the things I do very well that they tell me I do very well is I always ensure that when folks come to see me and come into the hospital, uh, because, of, because of my nature, I'm able to, you know, kind of get them to smile a little bit, you know, and, and, and be not so bleak about the fact that they're coming to visit a hospital. Uh, right now, the things I do is I, I'm, believe it or not, I really am a professionally uh, certified voiceover actor. Uh, since I've been told that I had an eloquent speaking voice and uh, I'm an eloquent public speaker, I have had some engagements. And I'm, I'm also been told that I'm an inspiration to my therapist and a strong advocate for others uh, suffering from brain injury and other disabilities. Uh, I'm sure that I can be an articulate advocate for others uh, recovering from brain injury and it can help to educate people about what brain injury is and what brain injury is not. So in my particular case right now, one of the things that I learned and I always keep, uh, you know, uh, you know making sure that people understand is the acronym ICE, uh, I-C-E, in case of emergency. A lot of people don't know about that. But uh, oh, by the way, if you have, uh, in case of emergency, uh, you have a card that says that uh, in case of emergency, it enables first responders to be able to, you know, to find your relatives and find your loved ones and all these kinds of things. So in case of emergency is a program that enables first responders such as paramedics, firefighters, and police officers. Um, to be able to contact the next of kin, uh, you know, by, by using a mobile phone or something because you have it. So I have it in my, in, in my I have, actually have that on my person. I have a card that has all that information. Another card that I have that I want to show you real quick. It's something, it's something that's really, really cool. And I think that you, you all really enjoy this. Uh, this is called this is a brain injury identification card. Brain injury identification card. And on that card has my name, my wife's name, and an emergency phone number for them to contact my wife if there's ever a, a problem. So this was something that came to me and I just thought it was something that would, would be very important to share. So that's one of the things that's been happening uh, in terms of my recovery. Uh, in addition, um, I just want to make sure that uh, one of the things I did that really helped me with my recovery is uh, I used music and I used music, you know, to, to, to put me in a good mood and those kinds of things. And I will tell you that uh, if you are in, so inclined, I do have a song I can share with you if you, if you would like that. And that really is, is representative to what we're doing because the song is called Lovely Day. And it's by Bill Withers. And the reason why I like that song so much is I thought about, you know, everything that I had been through uh, in terms of my accident and all the other things and how happy I was to have my loved ones, um, beginning with my wife, be there to support me uh, during my recovery. Uh, you know, and we would have family meetings. And at those family meetings, my kids, who are grown, grown up adults now, would have a chance to speak to me and, and share with me how my injury was affecting them. Ne uh, you know, and more importantly, the, 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 in some cases, the negative effects of how my injury was affecting them. And because of that, I learned so much about what kind of things to do and what kind of things not to do based on me trying to recover. So I thought that was important. And um, I also wanted to make sure that you know, I really, I really appreciate the work that was done because I realized it wasn't easy. And I realized also that in the case of family members and families, sometimes brain injury can be traumatic as well. Because as you already know, some families are not able to stay together when they have someone who has had a brain injury. And, uh, and I'm very fortunate that I'm, I'm blessed to have my wife and the fact that she stayed together with me. Uh, and, and, and we continue to move forward and move forward. And, and, we're, and we're very, very proud of that. But it, but it wasn't easy at all, uh, not, even, not, even, not even a little bit. And I want to just say that, uh, you know, once again, that music was healing for me. So at this particular point in time, the way and, and, this, and the, uh, the, the music that I'd like to share with you, it goes like this.
When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, something without warning, love, bears heavy on my mind. Then I look at you, and the world's all right with me. Just one look at you, and I know it's going to be a lovely day. A lovely day. So once again, I and you know I really believe that because when I think about it, you know how um, my life could have been now. Uh, very often, people talk to me and they say, "Derek, you know you're always in such a good mood based on the fact that you've had such a bad accident. You know why is it that you're that way?" And obviously, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the fact that you know the, uh, my car hit a deer. Uh, the deer, when they found me, the car was flipped over with the deer stuck through the my front of my windshield. I was in a coma. The deer died. I didn't die. Uh, I think there's a reason for that. So, you know, so, so I moved forward and I still like deer. I'm not mad at deer because, you know, it, it wasn't the deer's fault. It just, you know, things had just happened sometimes. But it's just one of those situations where, you know, it could have been so different. But the, you know the way things have turned out is is has been so much so much better. And oh, by the way, I'm proud to be, as I mentioned, a military veteran, and I am able to to you know to retrieve and, and receive my retirement benefits that definitely do come in handy. And I did something that's very interesting. Uh, when I had my accident, I applied for Social Security, and I got my Social Security benefits the first time I applied. And people say that's not normal. Usually, it takes a while. So once again, these are all these blessings that I have. As much as I would love to get back into the job market and work again, the fact of the matter is that based on my background in terms of what has happened to me, uh, it, it, it is uh, over, you know, the, the fact that I'm a brain injury survivor really makes a major difference in, to me trying to get back to the kind of work I used to do. And if I make, uh, if I try to get another uh, uh, opportunity that uh, pays more than my social security benefits, I would lose those benefits forever. And those benefits also go to my family as well. So I'm doing the right thing. You know, I'm satisfied with who Derek O'Neill is now. And the fact of the matter is, you know, brain injury is, is, is something that, you know, is not easy to understand because there's no such thing as one particular, you know, issue of a brain injury. You know, when you, you, you know, you can be affected in so many different ways because of brain injury. And I'm very glad that I know that. So once again, thank you again for allowing me thank to share you, my Derek. story. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. All right. So our next presenter is also from Alexandria, Virginia. We have survivor Kitty Tong here. Thank Hi. you Kitty, for being here. Hi, Amy, Andy, uh, brain injury, uh, survivor and caregiver, friends and guests. I I am Kitty. I am brain injury survivor and aphasia advocate. Some people say, uh, what is aphasia? Aphasia. Some people say uh, aphasia is lung cancer, or is it the country, or is it the robot? Not exactly. Aphasia is loss of language, reading, writing, and speaking, but not intellect. You're not born with aphasia. Uh, most people aphasia due to the brain. And then, uh, uh, for example, stroke, brain injury, tumor, or infection. My side, I was let left side my brain um uh two three years ago i was hit by the car walking home from work uh i was pedestrian injury for one month 
uh, I was a coma in life support. Nobody knew if I would survive. For five months, I relearned to walk to the red hand to red leg and double vision, but I have a fascia. Regina is my co-worker, my friend, my soulmate, and my twins, and she is my caregiver. I was so, so sad. I was so depressed. I was feeling like, what if, what if, what if, what if I just got back home? What if my ex-boyfriend, what if, what if? But now I'm feeling better. And I, my, my YouTube channel say S-A-Y Young Aphasia. Uh, please subscribe and support me. S-A-Y Young Aphasia. Uh, I, I interview SLP, OT, PT, professional, and my young aphasia. I'm trying to, what does that mean? Uh, my young aphasia, what does that mean? And my uh, ABBIS video of me, uh, every nine seconds on YouTube channels. Please support me too. So I am here to interview Kitty um, to help along with her words. Yes. Um, so what is the one thing you wish people understood about aphasia? Mm, my intellect is the same, but I'm just slower. Mm -hmm. I was just slower and uh, the friend or or stranger, I said, oh, just not fast, just slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But intellect is the same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So what has been the emotional impact of mm. aphasia? Now I'm not depressed or sad, but I am so frustrating because uh, my friends or stranger just so much faster and I just slower, slower. And then like my friend just, oh, what, what, what are you doing? And I just, I'm fine, but just not long sentences, just low, lower sentences, just like, uh, uh, just short. Uh, shorter. Yeah, just short shorter. sentences. Yeah, short sentences. <laughs> So other than short sentences, what are some things that you wish people would do when they communicate or interact with you? Uh, uh, I said, uh, just slower. And uh, um, we've had a lot of people shout at us. Oh, yeah. How are you? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then the uh, co-worker just, hi, hi. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh my intellect is the same, just normal. You and know? your hearing is fine. Yeah, it's the fine. <laughs> but for some reason, people seem to think talking louder will mm -hmm, help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you are very good also about saying, excuse me, mm -hmm. one more time, please. Mm -hmm. Or you show a picture yes. to help explain. Mm -hmm. So what is the single most important thing you've done in your recovery? Say it one more time. Sure. Most important thing in your recovery with aphasia. Uh, last time, last three years ago, I loved reading, mm -hmm. but now I'm still reading, but my uh, uh, listening in Audible and try to understand my book. You know, mm -hmm. so you listen to the book mm -hmm. at the same time you read the book. Yeah. And it helps to process. Yes, it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right. So last thing before we go. I mean, we've had some pretty funny moments with aphasia <laughs> and the wrong words coming out. So could what are some of the funny moments? With <laughs> yeah. 
uh, me and you in the uh, Easter. And then someone said that, oh, I, I was trying to say, oh, she is translator, but <laughs> I said, she is transgender. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my friends and the baby visit me and I just trying to oh you are so chubby you are so chubby but I said you are so fluffy you are so fluffy <laughs> <laughs> and who is your favorite football player oh uh, Tom maybe Brady Brady yeah but I said Tom Brady Tom Brady is so handsome <laughs> We love Tom Gravy. <laughs> and that's it here from Alexandria. And the uh, aphasia advocates, aphasia advocates at gmail.com. And happy birthday, Amy. Thank you for letting us share Kitty's incredible story. And um, keep up all the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Kitty, for being here and sharing. And, you know, I think the biggest lesson with aphasia is that it doesn't affect our intellect. And I think that's, that's also a lesson for TBI in general. Um, you know, we might be slower, we might say the wrong words, we might you know, not, not move as quickly. Um, we might have some physical disabilities or not. Um, and people often think that our intellect has been compromised and it's in most cases, it's not true. So yes. thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. All right. Next up, I believe we have another commercial from Simone Fortier. I will let Andy get that queued up for us. Hi, I'm Simone Fortier, under the Fascia Training Institute. TBI is life changing. Not only does it change your brain, it changes your pain and your personality. It's often called the invisible disease. You look fine on the outside, but on the inside, so much is going on. Overwhelm, fatigue, um, just chronic pain, migraines, headaches, sadness, and then just a loss of sense of self. And I know this personally because I've had six concussions myself in adulthood and over 50 as a child, along with having ADHD. I was the 20% that didn't get better. This led to creating a dynamic brain healing protocol that I've been teaching for 10 years to healthcare practitioners, as well as a brain health assessment that you can take right now. It determines the health of your brain and has been life-changing. It saved many lives this last couple of years and is looking at how, why you're not recovering from your head injury. For more information, reach out to info at simoneforche.com or follow me on social media, Simone Forche or the Fascia Training Institute. I look forward to supporting you get your brain back at any age. Take care. All right, so up next for our speakers, we have a survivor, Paige Spears, coming to us from Fulton, Missouri. Welcome, or are you actually Mississippi? I get those two mixed up. Missouri. Missouri, I was right, yay. <laughs> I second guessed myself. Okay. All right, welcome Paige. And I will be sharing three key areas that have helped me and been instrumental in my recovery in addition to what would have helped to prevent my injury to begin with since my injury was what's referred to as acquired and that is with no physical structural damage. It was caused by anoxia and that came from bilateral pulmonary embolism and the theory that I've developed in the last few years. It happened in May of 2016. So I'm in my fifth year out and I'm thinking what happened is that the blood clots probably came from 12 years of anti-anxiety medications and yes that built up in my system and caused the blood clots in addition to less than optimal nutrition and that is what led to the anxiety and depression and, and plus the antibiotics use in high school and the antibiotics when I got my wisdom teeth taken out in my early 20s so that is one key area of it also gave me a business idea for 
a program that I can share these areas and resources with other brain injury survivors who haven't, also haven't gotten the help they need right away. So nutrition and nutritional psychiatry is what I would recommend first. And then also functional movement optimization. And Amy's community is what brought me to the uh, functional medicine world and functional neurology. Since I watched the Brain Health Summit in 2018, and that gave me the idea to search and find a directory online of functional neurology practitioners, and I found mine in Central Missouri, Dr. Michael Schmidt. And he has also been a good regular speaker in my brain injury support group based in Columbia, Missouri. And also my somatic movement practitioner, Victoria Day, who is our support group facilitator, was also a speaker at this event earlier today. And then the third key area is energetic and emotional alignment. Since I was not feeling particularly enthusiastic about any of the employment I had previous to my injury, that's a big area for me too. And so I, well, I kept going with jobs that didn't feel right and didn't quite fit me. And uh, the ironic thing is that my, the last job I had before my injury and actually where it happened was at a collections attorney's office and I was working in the medical claims department. So the, I, I had actually had good medical insurance at the time and that paid for a vast majority of my five weeks inpatient stay, including the rehab hospital. And so I was at the office and it was in the afternoon and I was in the mail room, thankfully with some coworkers who were there when I said I couldn't breathe and, and just passed out and they did CPR until the ambulance got there. So then after that, it was well, my care team said they'd never seen a cardiac case come off this breathing in less than 24 hours. So my case is unique in that my anoxia was caused by pulmonary embolism. So I have a foot in both worlds and both communities. And the energetic and emotional alignment piece also comes in with the energy work that I had been doing prior to my injury that I think had a role in my survival and that, that I was able to continue with afterwards with group Reiki shares every month and other energy work and practices like a year and a half training with Integrated Medicine Institute online and that was based in Australia and that has, that used a system with essences, crystals, herbs, and charts with emotions and self images also to put together stories for healing and clearing things. And another system that I've used is human design. And that is a chart with birth time and information, like a unique sort of astrology chart. And in my case, I'm fulfilling my Mercury expression today with communicating, improving in integrity through enriching storytelling. So that also has been also a really interesting personal development way that I've healed and recovered also. And so then this led into my business idea since I was unable to drive after my injury and couldn't return to my my office that would have been it was 45 minutes from where I lived and transportation options were limited also so I figured I didn't know who else would hire me as a 
as someone with whose typing speed wasn't quite up there, I didn't know if I could get a job even as a VA or anything else. So I figured I'd do my own thing. And so I've gotten the idea to do something similar to what Amy offers in assembling a team of whole person focused practitioners who can contribute guest expert interviews in my program that I designed around the three key areas that I mentioned. And so I'm, I've been developing that. And I've also started an email list. So my call to action can be to go to pagespears.com and sign up for my email list. Thank you, Paige. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I just wanted to share with you um, that Dr. Michael Schmidt is going to be in my next Concussion Discussions Volume 2 coming out this year. Great to know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paige, for being here. All right, up next, we have Taryn Barlow, and she is a professional coming from Milford, Massachusetts. So welcome, Taryn. Hi, guys. As Amy said, my name is Taryn Barlow, and I am just so grateful and honored to be celebrating this day with a ton of incredible human beings. Uh, on this Brain Injury Awareness Day. I'd also like to wish our host a happy birthday, of course. Um, so I join you today as a practitioner, as an advocate, and also as a friend. I am the owner and CEO of The Well Brain, which is something that I've created. It, within that, I've created the title of a cognitive health coach. This is a combination of my background as a speech language pathologist, an integrative nutrition health coach, and a certified brain injury specialist. And this has really led me to passionately support individuals who have sustained brain injury. As you strive to combine all of the hard work you've done in rehab and recovery, and my role is the holistic combination in lifestyle as you merge all of those strategies, cognitive strategies, self-advocacy language, medical history organization, and your personal evolution to thrive again after sustaining brain injury. Um, I have turned, I have coined it the well brain method of hope. So enough, enough about me. I'm done. I'm done about me. Today is about awareness. And in particular, my focus is cognitive awareness. So what's cognition? What a dense word that word cognition really is. It takes cognition to know what cognition is. It is attention and problem solving and memory, organization, reasoning, executive function, now, all of those things do not live in a nice little bubble, especially while you're in recovery, navigating healing, and you're engaging with family, friends, work, home, community. It's impossible to put all of those cognitive skills in a bubble while you're doing all of those things. What I'm talking about, though, is that hour by hour, day by day, minute by minute, impact that cognition and emotion have. Can't really separate the two. For example, like if we have a memory hiccup when we're in a rush and our cell phone is ringing and our genes are maybe a little tighter than we would like them to be these days post pandemic. And we are thinking about this upcoming appointment and we also have an internal distraction of being hungry. Anybody ever have that experience or something similar? That's cognition and emotion. How about waiting in, at a doctor's appointment 
in a waiting room with fluorescent lights buzzing above your head, the TV blaring in the waiting room, and the phone ringing off the hook at the receptionist's desk. And you're thinking about the questions you want to ask your provider in that appointment. How do you think that impacts your cognitive function? Kind of get what I'm saying here, right? That experience is so visceral when you think about that doctor's office waiting. So a little more context. I was working with a client who was returning, again, going through the process of returning to work after sustaining about six concussions over the years. And she was also simultaneously reestablishing her medical team. Those are two huge tasks. As we worked together, we had to kind of figure out the sensory impact of this attempt to return to work virtually, lots of screen time. And we identified which of her senses in that environment were a little more of the senses that calmed her or the senses that triggered her. We had to strategize how to work through those things on a day-by-day basis, because although they may be similar, they vary day-to-day. This was this cognitive awareness for senses. Now I'm going to add the emotional piece. At the same time as she was balancing this return to work, she was getting all those portal messages and return phone calls from all those new doctors. And this was impacting her cognitive attention as she was trying to return to work because it required all of this executive function management to be happening in these two tasks. Plus it was the emotional variable of reestablishing a medical team. So we continued with repetition building confidence, problem solving, a little bit of daily self-assessment and monitoring. And we got curious about her individual journey and struggles and successes and how to support her foundationally as she managed this. Can you imagine the attention, the memory, the organization, and the executive function gymnastics that were happening inside of her brain on top of the emotional journey that she was experiencing in reestablishing medical care. So can we ignore emotions impact on cognition? Nope. I would love for all of the incredible awareness for triggers and sensitivities and personal needs that I see shine through so many individuals who have sustained brain injury to have one more additional piece to the puzzle. The awareness for all of the five, okay, one more six, because I add gut instinct for a sixth sense to connect with cognition. In the moment when you're feeling cognitively a little off, you can identify what's happening in all of those six senses outside of yourself and internally. Can you name those things? Can you re-engage your brain during those things? And can you move through it and with it to develop that cognitive awareness? If you continue to do that and be, increase that cognitive awareness, you're improving your cognitive confidence which is like a muscle that absolutely loves to be worked out and it loves repetition. The brain loves repetition. Here's my most favorite place to support people and hold hold people accountable as the well brain. So the next time you're feeling a little bit uh, confused, cognitively foggy, and you ask yourself, why am I struggling on this task that I have done a bunch of times. Stop. Become aware of all of your senses outside of yourself and inside of yourself. The ability to start to identify those somethings that's pulling your cognition will help you through those cognitive hiccups. It'll allow you to give it a little more grace, 
It'll allow you to move through it with it. See if you can notice any trends that are happening. For some reason, my cognition always pulls by a sound. Maybe your sense of sound is a little more heightened. You can keep making that cognitive progress that I have seen and witnessed in so many incredible survivors. I am sending you all so much resilience and courage and tenacity and the empathy from my heart in your healing journey. You can feel free to join me on Instagram at Taryn underscore the well brain. I love engaging and supporting and advocating with you. And I am absolutely wishing you guys all a beautiful brain injury awareness day. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. And it was wonderful to be here today. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And it's so true. It takes cognition to understand cognition. So, so true. Um, thank you just so much for being here and sharing with us today. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have a commercial, uh, the self-care sanctuary. And I will let Andy cue that. I'm Linda Forrest founder of the Inspired Evolution Project. Our brains are evolving and the primal fight or flight mechanisms of our ancestors are no longer working. Traumatic injury, especially to the brain, causes a cyclic reaction in these mechanisms, enlarging our amygdala to create a tremendous amount of suffering in our lives. The good news is that recent discoveries in neuroscience have taught us that you can shrink your amygdala. I was in a car accident where I experienced a traumatic brain injury and my fight or flight mechanisms went out of control. The pain, fear, confusion, and frustration was nearly unbearable until I learned how to shrink my amygdala. That process saved my life and gave me purpose to share what I learned with others. On March 16th, 2022, I will discuss how the brain works, how the body responds, and how you can get the most out of both. All right, so welcome our next guest. Uh, we have Linda Forrest from Oren, Utah, joining us. Welcome, Linda. Oh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much and happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be a part of this event and, and I'm so inspired by all of the speakers. It's been just absolutely wonderful to um, interact here. Uh, as, as Amy said, my name is Linda Forrest. I am the founder of the Inspired Evolution Project. And what we are is a mentorship program to help people understand how the brain works, how the body responds to that, and how you can get the most out of both. Um, I began this journey of developing this program as uh, I suffered from complex PTSD. And then in 2003, I had a car accident. Uh, so I understand the pain of brain injury. And what I'd like to share is the process that I offer to help people heal. When we experience trauma of any kind, we are triggering that fight or flight mechanism in the brain. And this is amplified when it's a trauma to the brain because the body is especially protective of the brain. Um, so what I offer is a four-step process for how to come out of that fight or flight mechanism and not only into rest and digest, but beyond rest and digest to actually start to heal the brain. So in this process, I'm gonna show you the four steps and then I'll give you information if you want to know more. Um, so the first step that we must take in this process is to feel safe. So of course, most of us know by this point that we, need to move from fight or flight to rest and digest before we can do anything. So there is a lot out there in um, medical practices now about 
doing meditation to relieve stress. But one of the things that we must understand is that we can't meditate while those stress mechanisms, while that amygdala is engaged. It is biologically impossible because it's a different brain function. And a lot of people might uh, struggle with meditation and think they're somehow failing it when the truth is you just have to take a step before it. So the first step that we must take is to feel safe. We need to move out of the fight or flight into a rest and digest state before we can meditate. We can do this by anything that comforts us. So I'm gonna offer you four suggestions today that are specifically proven to relieve stress uh, and disengage that amygdala. So the first one is one, and a couple of these I love, I've already heard mentioned, one is to breathe. So one of the things that happens when we trigger is our breath tightens, our body tightens. So as much as the brain causes the body to react, the body can also cause the brain to react. So if we stop and take deep breaths, it will, re it will stop the trigger of that amygdala. So uh, what I like is what I call a, a 30 second meditation to just take 10 deep breaths. It takes about 30 seconds and it completely changes how the brain's functioning in that moment. Another commonly known one is mild exercise. Uh, this can be yoga or Tai Chi or just going for a walk. Starting to move the body increases circulation to the brain, which then improves the brain function. Now, a couple that I offer in my program are kind of a little different, but they come from scientific studies on what disengages the amygdala. So when we trigger in the amygdala, we revert back to primal function. So we revert, revert back to knowledge that is not our most recent knowledge. It might be childhood knowledge. It might be um, 10 years ago. It could be all the way back to pre-education. So one of the things that we do in our program is revert back to what we understood as children, but then complicate it because it starts to shut down the uh, amygdala. So for example, you can do the alphabet backwards. Because you know the alphabet, it's familiar, but then you do it backwards. Another thing is adding sums. Uh, so one plus one is two, two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. These begin to uh, cause the brain to have to start to think because we move to higher numbers relatively quickly. The thing that's most important with this stage is to meet yourself where you are. For me, the alphabet backwards wasn't an option after my accident. I, I had to relearn how to spell. And uh, each word that I had to relearn, I was a labor. So what you want this to be is a comfort. So if you can't do the alphabet, do the breathing or find something that brings you comfort, things that you've learned in your own process. The important part after this step is not just to go into rest and digest, otherwise it causes a bounce back and forth that can keep us in a state of suffering. So the next step we wanna take is to activate our prefrontal cortex. This is, uh, so the recent studies in neuroscience have shown us that if you do 20 minutes a day of, of the correct kind of activation of your prefrontal cortex, it actually shrinks your amygdala. The study showed that after five weeks of this kind of practice, there was a visible difference in the size of the amygdala, which is a huge discovery. So this is why meditation is so important. But it's important, again, to find ways to do this if we are, aren't already adept at something like mindfulness meditation. We have other options that kind of force the brain to do it for us. So I'm going to give you four more options to do this. And we remember we do this, we do the, the comfort first, get into rest and digest first. And then uh, the first one I recommend is go somewhere new. When the brain has to process information that's unfamiliar, it engages the prefrontal cortex to start to take in new information. We go into an observational state. So this is why vacations often help us feel so good because we're engaging new environments. The second one that I use a lot in my program is non-dominant hand work. You can do this with anything during the day. Uh, you're brushing your teeth, uh, using keys. 
what it does is it challenges the brain. Uh, one of the common things we use is coloring books. So uh, some people use for relaxation technique, those coloring books with like mandalas and such in them. Uh, if you switch to your non-dominant hand, stay within the lines, completely fill the space, <laughs> don't judge yourself or try to rush. Just let yourself take the time to try and color with your non-dominant hand. It will trigger an instant state of mindfulness because it's difficult. Um, so this leads me to the third one, which is learning something new. <laughs> this is a really great way to engage our prefrontal cortex. Learning something new immediately causes us to have to shift our brain function. And especially if it's something we're bad at, <laughs> this is the key. We have to be bad at it. So um, like it could be learning juggling. It could be uh, learning how to knit. It could be learning, um, for me, learning to uh, walk in certain ways. Again, all of that became that practice where, okay, this is my mindfulness practice. Again, I only need to do 20 minutes and you can start these practices in as little as five minutes a day and start to feel a difference. The other is mindfulness practices. Um, taking care, stopping and doing a body scan, just checking in. Okay, I'm aware of my toes. I'm aware of my feet. I'm aware of the temperature and the texture of the air in the room. Um, I'm aware of what I see. I'm, I tap into all of those senses. Um, so as we start to do this, this starts to shrink the amygdala, amygdala and then those, those reactionary states take it, it, what it does is it corrects them on a brain function level. So now it's not an arduous journey to try and, and recover certain things, but when we change the way the brain is functioning, functioning and allow it to begin to heal from the injuries, it organically produces the results we're hoping for. And so instead of trying to focus and be centered and not be reactive to what's going on around us, the brain organically becomes less reactive. So in our program, just to finish up uh, through step, in step three of the program, we start to move more towards innovation and transforming completely out of that fight or flight response mechanisms from primal behavior and into a more evolved brain function. Uh, but I think the most important thing that I want to finish up on is the fact that for me, the most devastating thing about having a brain injury was that I wasn't me anymore. I wasn't the me I knew. And that was devastating to me. There were a lot of abilities I had before my accident that I lost and I still don't have and I will probably never have again. And the, the thing I learned in it and what is step stage four of my, my program is that I can now choose out of an infinite amount of possibilities. I can be anyone. So instead of trying to grasp for who I was or who I thought I should be, I could start saying, you know what? The, the door's wide open. I can be whatever I wanna be. I can, uh, create some something new in my life. And I think I hear that a lot. So um, this is the basis of it. I do want to thank you again. It's been such an amazing journey. And um, if you want to learn more, uh, we're at the inspired evolution project.com. Thank you so much for your, for the time, Amy. Thank you, Linda. And I think you had such um, important points. And I really liked the coloring with your non-dominant hand. Because um, anytime you're forced to just have to work harder, it, it kind of shuts everything else off and brings you into the present moment. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all those points with us today. Welcome. Thank you again for having me. Okay, up next, we have Marsha Moran from Centerville, Virginia. She is a stroke survivor, and I've had the lovely opportunity of having lunch with her when I was out there. I think that was 2020, right? Yeah, yeah, because I remember I was like, no, I'm not shaking hands. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, welcome. So happy birthday, Amy. Thank you. You are giving us such a lot to think about. And I think every 
person has given something so much of value today. So you can get better as long as you think you can. Good afternoon, everyone. Have you ever been told that you have six months to a year to get best, better after your stroke or brain injury? And after that, you're done? Don't believe it. I know you can get better as long as you think you can. And I can prove that the one year mark is just that, another day on the calendar. In this session, I will be talking about aphasia. That is a communication disorder that can impact speech, reading and writing. And up to 40% of folks who have had a stroke also have aphasia. If you have aphasia, you might be thinking, why doesn't she talk like she doesn't have it? Well, <laughs> you wouldn't have thought that eight years ago when I woke up on a Sunday morning, I felt off. Instead of getting up, I rolled over and turned to go back to sleep. When I was rolling over, the most excruciating headache happened right here. And despite that pain, I fell asleep. When I woke up the next time, I knew that I was in real trouble. My right side was paralyzed. I had to make it from the bed to the stairs so I could yell down to my husband to get help. I didn't know if I could make it. I rolled off the bed and began dragging myself with my left hand across the floor. I made it halfway down the hallway and ran out of gas. I figured that my husband would come up for something to drink. I would have to wait for him to get thirsty. Why didn't I call out to him? I didn't think of it. Crash, something fell. I don't know what, but it made Jim come upstairs. That's when he found me. He asked, are you all right? I opened my mouth and nothing came out. Jim next asked, can you talk? <laughs> Clearly the answer was no. He called 911 and we waited for the paramedics to come. Among other things, I was paralyzed on my right hand side and I had aphasia. In essence, I needed to learn to walk again and I needed to learn to talk again. It turns out that learning to walk was way easier than learning to talk. I worked every day at trying to get my right side to move properly. It took one and a half years, many therapists and my husband before someone seeing me on the street would say that I walked normally. I still had pain, but people on the outside didn't see that. Talking, that was a different story. I had broke his aphasia. Broca area is right here, just in front of the left ear. And that's where my stroke happened. According to the National Aphasia Association, I had an acquired communication disorder that impairs a person's ability to process language, but was not affecting intelligence. In the beginning, I couldn't speak at all. With Broca's aphasia, I could hear and understand what everyone said. I had the words to say, they're right here in my mind, but I couldn't get them out of my mouth. The linkage in my brain was broken. Occasionally I could say something. Normally it wasn't that I was truly thinking. It is, if I had two people in my head, the one who couldn't say anything and the one who could say anything that was kind of making sense. Frustrating, you bet. According to the National Aphasia Association, if the symptoms of aphasia last longer than two or three months after a stroke, a complete recovery is unlikely. I didn't like hearing those words and I decided I would overcome aphasia. The crazy part is that at three and a half years, I kind of did. I wrote a book about my experience with the stroke called Stroke Forward, How to Become Your Own Healthcare Advocate, One Step at a Time. Writing my story unearthed another problem that I had from my aphasia. I could read after my stroke, <laughs> but I couldn't write. It took a lot of looking at thesaurus.com and thinking about the words I was trying to say, how they were put together before I tried to type them. It took four and a half years for me to write and publish my book, Stroke Forward. So what was the therapy that I received after three and a half years? It's called microcurrent neurofeedback. The neurofeedback device is a little larger than a smartphone. It has EEG or electroencephalogram. 
Try saying that three times, even if you don't have aphasia. Anyway, five EEG lids come off of it. Two positive, two negatives, and a ground. The doctor rubbed gummy paste on my head to create a connection for the leads. And I like to think they come as cat's fit, a little rough and definitely wet and sticky. When the doctor fired up the neurofeedback feedback machine, I felt nothing. I wondered if he had taken me for a ride. <laughs> the pulses were there, I just couldn't feel them. A one one hundredth of a double A battery was all that it took to get my brain to rebuild itself over a matter of weeks. You know when your computer is stuck, you turn it off and then on again and it works like it should? That's kind of how my brain worked. Later that day, I noticed that I could talk a little better. After 16 sessions, I could speak as I do today. The two people in my head have merged into one. The neurofeedback did more than work on my speech. My movement got better, my foot drop got better, and apparently my happiness quotient got better. I literally began laughing uproariously during therapy. Does neurofeedback work for everybody? No. Studies have shown that it helps about 85% of people with brain injuries. In my mind, it was worth giving it a try. I want to conclude by reminding you that you can get better as long as you think you can. If a doctor says that you can't get better after the first year, you might consider finding a different doctor. Microcurrent neurofeedback is safe. It changes brain waves that have been stuck. 85% of brain injury patients get better after using it, and I was one of them. And lastly, if you have an unbearable headache, you need to call 911. Don't go back to sleep like I did. There is more to this story. I tried a lot of things that did and did not work. The things that did work were cumulative in my estimation, and that includes a refresher on the neurofeedback machine. I have had four additional treatments. I also became a certified health, life, health and life coach for people with brain injuries and their caregivers. If you're interested in knowing more, please contact me at marcia at strokeforward.com. That's M-A-R-C-I-A at strokeforward.com. And if you want a free gift, please log into my website and look for under health and life coach for mental rehearsal. It's a sample of what coaching with me feels like. Enjoy the rest of this non-invisible event. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And you know, I think we're often, whether it's stroke or TBI, I think we're often told, well, if you're not better in a year, this is as good as you're going to get. And I know I was told that yeah. and it's just simply not true. It's so antiquated. Like, it's like, how have doctors like not evolved in their thinking? Like the research is out there. Like, do you not keep up on things? Um, yeah. so it's super frustrating. So, yeah. you know, honestly, no matter, I was two and a half years before I found functional neurology, which is what helped me. And, you know, I've met people that are five, 10, 15 years out before they get to the proper doctor and there's always room for improvement. Yeah. Um, obviously the further out you are, the more work it might take, mm -hmm. um, but it's still possible to make great strides. So thank you, Marsha. You're quite welcome and happy birthday, Kim. Thank you. It's like the best birthday party ever. <laughs> All right. Our next presenter is Mary Varga from Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome, Mary. Oh, you're muted. Mary. Oh, I see you're unmuted, but I still can't hear you. Can you hear me? You, oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Now we got it. <laughs> Technology. Technology, I know. And I'm not the one to ask about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Mary. Thank you. Well, I'm so honored to be here speaking today on Brain Injury Awareness Day. And I really do hope that you can take at least one or two of the tips I present 
and maybe incorporate it into your own daily routine or maybe use it to help someone else. Now, we are all tripart beings. We have a spirit, a mind, and a body. And I would like to talk about some therapies that I found helpful in all three of those areas. And I'll start with the body. Now, as brain injury survivors, we all know that you can have all kinds of different physical challenges. Or maybe as a survivor, you have no physical challenges. But I've lost my place. You had said um, we might have physical challenges. I knew what was going on. Now, I have had to deal with um, this uh, balance disability for almost 25 years. And it's gotten better over time, but So I guess that does just prove right up front that the human brain is capable of recuperating. So as a fitness instructor, it's my job to give my classes to get them working or moving in the right direction. Now I give my classes constant body pumps in order to help us exercise correctly. And I want to share two of those exercise prompts that I use with my class. And these are not strength or balance exercises. These are just posture cues to help us to get into the right alignment. So I'll start with um, our hip alignment. We all need to have our hips in the right position. But in order to do that, I wanted to introduce you to my class mascot, Susie. Now, Susie's real excited because I bought her new uh, tennis shoes for the occasion. And the reason why Susie is my mascot is because she has a long monkey tail. And I will, uh, many times throughout my classes, I will tell them, to take the monkey tail and tuck it between the legs. And if you would do that, even now when you're sitting, if you tuck your imaginary tail between your legs, then immediately you'll feel that your bottom tucks under and your hips come forward. And then if I also go on to tell you to take that tail and pull it up towards your chest, then immediately you'll feel that your ab muscles engage, your rib cage comes up, and you open your chest. So I guess the main thing about tucking your tail that's important is it gives an element of stability to your uh, pelvic bones. So if you ever feel wobbly or about to lose your balance, just quickly tuck your tail and that puts your hands in the position where they can't be moved. So that that's the first cue was um, about uh, tucking your tail. Now the second cue that I usually give classes is helps them to keep their head in the right position. So this Tip actually did not come from one of my physical therapists. It came from my optometrist. And he was trying to show me how to read with my uh, nostrils because the bifocals at the bottom of the glass. So I was looking, I'm, I'm pretending my hand is a book. And as I'm looking at the text, if I read with my nostrils, Notice that immediately my head comes up, my nostrils obviously come up, and my ears pull back over my shoulders, which is exactly where your head is supposed to be. So I decided to 
take the suggestion from my optometrist and turn it into a visual cue for my classes. So now I not only read with my nostrils, I leave my classes with my nostrils. I mean, I do everything leading with my nostrils. I sit, stand, and move, keep my nostrils up. Even when I bend forward to pay something up, I bend in my hip so I can still remember to keep that uh, my nostrils up. So just for fun, if you want, when you go home tonight to brush your teeth, lead with your nostrils. Now, obviously, you're going to have to bend at your hips to get your head over the sink. But once you're there, if you're spitting out the toothpaste, keep your nostrils up. You can still look down the sink, but keep your nostrils up as you spit. And that way, you, you will start to feel the right position of your head. And it's over time you will you will start automatically leading with your nostrils. So my two body therapy cues are tuck your tail and lead with your nostrils. So let's move on to our mind therapy. Now I think the easiest, uh, not the easiest, but the most effective. Uh, Mind therapy that I've, my therapy strategy that I've come across is writing. And as a published author, I love to write. So that was real easy for me. And I'm a big proponent of journaling. Now, when you journal, you can go to the bookstore. Excuse me. Yeah. Go to the bookstore and get one of these pretty journals, or you get them at the drugstore. But I suggest that um, you actually journal on your laptop because you can just make an easy document, you know, journal 2021, journal 2022. And that way you can just scroll back if you want to, and I do encourage you to scroll back because you want to be able to look through your journaling at where you've made improvements, maybe where you're still stuck. And journaling is, is an excellent way to uh, use our expressive writing. It's a good way to just think or say anything you want to. It doesn't have to be what you did that day. But as a writer, I find that journaling is very, very therapeutic. And for some reason, when you say something in writing in your mind, it's down. So hopefully you'll be more apt to do it. Now, the other part of our mind therapy is well, it's in our mind that we actually reinvent ourselves. And as brain injury survivors, we all have the ability to recreate ourselves. So maybe we can't, we can no longer do everything we did before. Or maybe there's some things that we can't do at all. But your job then in recreation is to find something else you can love, or find something else that you can be defined by. Now, prior to my brain injury, I was a long distance runner. I mean, I loved it. I did it every day. But since my brain injury, I now run, a, I still run, but I'm running a fitness business where I see different seniors and actually brain injury survivors how to move correctly. So I know that sounds like well simple. Like one day I was a runner and then boom, next day I was a fitness business owner. Well, recreation does not happen overnight. It's a long process. So you have to be very careful 
to be patient with yourself and not expect things to turn around overnight. Just keep plugging forward. Now, I said I was going to talk about mind, body, and, and spirit. So let's talk about spiritual therapy for a minute. Now, most of us believe that a higher power is controlling our universe. Now, I'm a Christian, so I call that a higher power God, or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that one of the greatest things we can do to have a happy life is to be a blessing for others. And I think brain injured survivors have the ability to be a blessing every day. And that's because we inspire people. If we can't do so, if we can do something, we we'll leave others with the impression that maybe it's time for them to step out of their comfort zone and try to do it themselves. Because we certainly are out of our comfort zone every day of our life. So my spiritual suggestion, my spiritual therapy suggestion is simply to stay close to God. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. So just stay close to God all day long. He's always there. Just like an invisible friend. I know the name of this conference is not invisible, but even though we're, we're visible, we need to have an invisible friend that we can talk to all day long. And just remember finally that as brain injury survivors, I think that people are watching us. They're watching us because they want to see how we respond to things or what, what kind of reaction we're going to have when things, different things happen. So let's surprise them all with the peace that we have about what life has handed us. And finally, let's use our God-given talents to inspire others to make them desire to be a better version of themselves. Thanks, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for joining us today. And what great cueing tips. I really like the nostrils one because it does. It, yeah. it gets your head right in place, especially <laughs> when we live at a computer and our phones. All I know, around. I know. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. All right, next. Oops mix that up there we go all right up next we have a short commercial from brooke mills and national concussion awareness day and i'll let andy cue that up and just so you know there is no sound for this one so don't don't think that your computer's malfunctioning on you um here we go All right. Okay, so welcome our next guest, Brooke Mills, um, a survivor from Boiling Springs, South Carolina. And currently, I don't quite remember your title. Um, you're Miss Something, New Hampshire. 
I'm Miss Rockingham County, Rockingham so I'll be County. competing for Miss New Hampshire in April. Thank you so much, Amy. Happy birthday. Thank you. Your mom <laughs> it is truly the best birthday your, party. It is. It's the best birthday <laughs> party. And your mom posted some great pictures um, this morning of us at um, Branger Awareness Day. So that. welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanted to be able to talk today about the five things that I learned as a post-concussion syndrome survivor. Um, so I, like that uh, commercial had said, I suffered a brain injury, a concussion when I was 14 years old. I was playing team handball in my high school gym class. And if you don't know what team handball is, it's kind of like soccer and basketball combined. So I'm short and pretty petite at 5'1", and I went to go pick up a ball and a boy went to go kick that same ball and ended up kicking the left side of my face, knocking me unconscious. Um, and I had no idea what a concussion was. I was a competitive dance. I was a competitive dancer and so I had never played any sports. I didn't understand what brain injuries were or how they could affect me. I thought I was immune to that because I wasn't a football player. Um, and so it really was quite a learning curve to be able to understand uh, that I, what, what I was experiencing and that each concussion truly is so unique. Um, I most notably lost about five years of memory. So uh, two and a half years before my injury, I lost memory of, and there was about a year and a half that I did not, was not able to create new memories. Um, and so altogether, it rounds up being about five years. Um, and I, I also had ongoing headaches, uh, dizziness, severe vertigo, um, migraines, which I had never had before in my life, um, memory problems still ongoing today, and um, light sensitivity were my biggest symptoms from my concussion. Uh, just this past Friday on, I believe, March 11th uh, was my eight-year anniversary of my concussion. So I continue to see changes, positive changes. Uh, I don't have headaches very much anymore. Light sensitivity is very rare. Uh, the only things that I still suffer from are memory issues, short-term and long-term, and occasional vertigo, as well as I get about one hiccup every hour uh, because part of my brain that was affected regulates your blood oxygen level, and so I constantly have a little bit less oxygen than I should, and so my diaphragm will spasm, so I will have a hiccup every once in a while. Um, I'm currently a graduate student at Sherman College of Chiropractic, and so my classmates love to make fun of my hiccups that happens about once an hour. <laughs> all right, so like I said, I wanted to chat with you all about the top five things that I learned as a um, concussion syndrome survivor. The first thing is to be your own advocate and seek out um, support and healing options and be open to alternatives. Um, I've been on the call for a little while now and I've already heard of so many different strategies on finding a doctor and finding therapies that really work with you and for you and how each case can be so unique. Um, I was 14 years old at the time and I remember going to a supposedly incredible concussion doctor in the state of New Hampshire. And um, he wanted to put me on a prescription medication that was on trial for Alzheimer's due to my memory issues. And at 14 years old, that really wasn't something that I was interested in doing. And so we had to seek other alternatives for care. I started doing hyperbaric oxygen tanks, um, to help with my blood oxygen. I also started doing uh, IV glutathione, resting. I obviously was no longer a dancer um, and being able to just challenge my brain and my eyes in the ways that really resonated and was working for me. So being your own advocate and finding those healing routes obviously is going to help you the most in the future. Second is to be patient with your body. Healing takes time. I've already heard two people mention this today, uh, but I remember going to a Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire uh, fundraiser and it was a walk. And I think I was about a year and a half after my concussion and I still hadn't seen a lot of improvements in my symptoms. I was obviously still being very affected with my memory issues. 
I was having headaches and migraines more times uh, than not. And it was really hard to get through high school and finish that out and have the energy to do everything that I wanted to be able to do. Um, but I remember hearing so many survivors tell me, just keep giving it time and be patient because uh, years and years later, you will continue to see improvements. And I saw the bulk of my improvements at five years after my brain injury. Um, now I'm eight years out. And like I said, I really only have those two lingering symptoms, which I never would have imagined would have been the case if you had asked me, you know, a year after my brain injury or even a few months after my concussion. Third thing I wanted to talk to you about is to keep a sense of humor in your situation. I mentioned how my classmates love to make fun of my hiccups, uh, although it really doesn't bother me at all. I love being able to bring humor, humor into my brain injury and some of the things that I have to cope with on a daily basis. Um, I started a blog very early on after my concussion and one of my most notable blog posts was about this cookie. So I was uh, going to tutoring and I'm allergic to gluten. I have been for quite a while. And so finding gluten-free cookies that were really good is hard to come by. And I had this package of two cookies and um, I bought it from the store and I ate one right before I was about to go into my tutoring session. And um, I remember putting it away in my backpack and I was gonna eat it later. And I looked for this cookie for about a week. I could not find it. I had completely lost it. And I was super sad because it's hard to come by a good gluten-free cookie. Um, and then all of a sudden it just hit me. I don't even know where I was at the time, but it hit me that I ate the second cookie when I ate the first cookie and I never even saved it. <laughs> but it's those memory stories and those humors, uh, humor, humorous times when it comes into brain injuries that we have to uh, help us get through um, and remember the journey and the process and where we've come from and where we want to be. Fourth thing is to find new hobbies and activities that you can enjoy post brain injury. I've also heard other people talk about this. I was a competitive dancer. I had been for about 12 years before my brain injury. I was dancing about 30 hours a week. So for a 14 year old, that was a lot. <laughs> um, and I was unable to go back to dance classes. I had tried a few times um, and each time I tried to jump or turn, um, I got so dizzy, very nauseous. Um, and so it just wasn't going to be in the cards for me. But I found a lot of joy in doing new hobbies. I really enjoyed uh, yoga, especially post brain injury. It was something I could totally relate to Amy with and enjoying um, yoga and finding peace and meditation with that. Uh, I also started singing. So I mentioned when I uh, first hopped on here that I'm competing for Miss New Hampshire this coming April, so next month. And there's a talent that goes into that. And I was always a dancer and I still wanted to be able to participate in the Miss America organization. And so I started singing um, just after my brain injury so that I was still able to participate. And I have found so much joy and passion for that as well. And number five is the last one and that's not to give up. I really had times where I didn't think that I was going to get any better. Um, where bullying in high school got out of control and I never thought I was going to see a day outside of it. Uh, I know that I'm pretty young and a lot of you might not be in high school or in college anymore, uh, but not giving up and pe being able to continue to find that hope um, within each day and note down your changes, whether that's positive, negative, and just um, remember to not give up. Last thing is um, my invitation to National Concussion Awareness Day, which this year in 2022, right? That's our year. Uh, it is on September 16th. So you can share your story with the hashtag National Concussion Awareness Day. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. We love to share a lot of new up and coming research on brain injuries and especially concussions. Um, I wanted to be able to designate a day just to concussions, um, to be able to bring about awareness to our students, our youth, um, to be able to take concussions a lot more seriously.
that's all I have for you. Thank you so much, Amy. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And it's funny how we really don't know what year it is anymore, isn't it? Like, <laughs> I have no idea. And like, I was just telling year. someone like last year I went out to DC and I'm like, wait, now that's been two years. Two years. I cannot <laughs> There's like believe a time it. warp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so September 16th, National Concussion Awareness Day. Um, and what, what is the website for that? It is, you can go to nationalconcussionawarenessday.org. All spelled out. Perfect. Yes. Well, thank you, Brooke, for being here. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. Happy birthday again. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Up next, we have Dr. Terrence Tensable, and he is a doctor here in Minnesota. So welcome. And I'm sure I slaughtered your last name. So please correct me. <laughs> Oh, I can barely hear you. Oh, let's turn it up a little. Okay, is that better now? Um, a little bit. A little bit. Okay, that's as high as I can go. Um, Do you have the right microphone connected? Yeah, I hope so. How about if I talk louder like this? There you go. <laughs> okay. My name is Dr. Terrence Tansabell. I'm an optometrist with practices in Litchfield and Annandale, Minnesota. These are two small towns about an hour west of Minneapolis. I am a graduate of Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota and Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon. And what I wanna share with you today is uh, some information about my concussion practice. Uh, I'm gonna start by just mentioning a few of the things that I look for during the course of the examination. Uh, I'll cover what these things are, how they impact my patients on an everyday basis. And then I'll go into some remediation, how I, I handle them. So the first thing that I would be looking for in, in, in the examination is I look for a vertical imbalance between the two eyes. Most people have eyes that are on the same level, but in concussion, the eyes start to deviate vertically. Um, this could cause double vision in a severe case, but people fight that tendency and tend to bring them together. But uh, if they can't, then they would just tip their heads, which would uh, make the eyes on the, you know, bring them to the same level. The, another thing that I look for is uh, a recession of their near point of convergence. We call it an NPC. Uh, a normal person uh, could follow a target coming in towards, their, towards them, and they would not see double till the target was perhaps two inches from their, uh, the bridge of their nose. And then they can recover single vision at three inches. But in concussion, I often see these numbers at 12 to 18 inches. And I've had patients that have an NPC of 48 inches uh, from, their, from the bridge of their nose. Um, the next thing that I look at are midlines. You have a vertical midline and a horizontal midline. In a vertical midline, the way I check it is I will have my patients sitting and just facing straight ahead. And I turn, have them turn their eyes to the side. And I tell them, I'm gonna move this target across in front of you. And I want you to tell me when it's right in front of your nose. And I start moving it. And oftentimes it'll go past their nose. And then they say, now. And I go to the other side and I come by, I start coming towards the center and I get to that same place and they might say now, or it might go past the nose again to the other side. And then they say now. Those are two different kinds of vertical midline shifts and they are treated differently. To assess a horizontal midline, similar instructions, I start with the bead above and I tell them that I wanna know when it's level with their eyes and I start to lower it and off. Doc, your voice just went completely away. You're, you're not transmitting. but it usually a more common thing is that when this person is reading they lose their place or they reread over and over 
because let's say they're holding their eyes level and as they get to the end of the line and make like that quick movement back, that's when the eyes split apart. Now, if the eye which is down below ends up on the correct line, but the upper eye is the one that picks up fixation, they're gonna be on the same line that they just read. Conversely, if the eye, when the eye split, if it's the top line that is in the right place, but the lower eye is down and it takes up fixation, they will have skipped the line completely. You can see how this would impact uh, the ability to read. Um, that reduced NPC that I talked about, it can cause either a double, a constant or an intermediate, uh, not intermediate, an intermittent uh, double vision. Uh, the way it could cause the intermittent, let's say that your NPC is 14 inches from your eyes and you hold your book 16 inches away when you read. As you're reading and your eyes become fatigued and stressed, that NPC goes from 14 out to 15 inches, pretty soon out to 16 inches, and that's when the double vision starts to be a factor. The midlines uh, are probably my favorite thing. Um, let's say that a patient has a vertical midline that shifted to their right. I always have people walk in my uh, practice and I'm watching them walk. But if your midline is shifted to the right and I have you walking down the hall, you're gonna drift to the right and then you make a compensatory uh, step back to the center. You keep going, you're drifting to the right, you come back to the center. And I ask uh, these people, uh, if they have any trouble when they're walking around and they say, you know, when I go through a, a doorway from one room to the other, I'm always hitting my right shoulder. Or when I'm walking down a long corridor, I keep my right hand uh, against the wall so that I don't rub my shoulder against the wall. So what do you do to uh, remediate these things? Before I explain that, let me just give a little quick, my definition of the visual system. There's two parts of the visual system. Uh, one, the one that everybody's familiar with who's ever had their eyes examined is called the focal system. The focal system is for identification. It's when you put up a bunch of letters across the room and you just read them. So it's sharp acuity. It really only does central vision and it's a relatively slow system. And um, it usually is not affected at all in a concussion but it's the other part of the visual system that is affected in concussion called the ambient system. You can think of the ambient system as taking care of peripheral vision, but it's so much more than that. The ambient system tells you if you're stationary and the world is moving past you, or if the world is stationary and you're moving through it. It includes things like visual kinesthesia, visual proprioception, um, and so that's a lot of stuff that it has to take care of. And so by necessity, that's a real fast system. But that system can't handle, or the brain can't handle all that information uh, when it's damaged by concussion. So I often will just go up to my, you know, to my patients, I'll put my hands right here, and they say, oh, that's much better, that feels good. Why is that? It's because I've eliminated a lot of that peripheral vision and the amount that they have to take care of and be aware of is reduced and they can handle that. These people have found compensatory actions. Um, they go grocery shopping at midnight when it's quiet in the store because if they go in the daytime, there's people coming towards them, coming up behind them, crossing diagonally in front of them uh, and the noise and it's just too much for them to handle, okay? The beauty of the uh, of the ambient system, and here's where the treatment comes in, is that it responds to straight edges, and I'll explain that. In my practice, I, I test my patients using lenses. They, I clip them on their glasses. What a lens does, it, it shifts perception of where something is. If you think that your vertical midline is here, I will use prisms to shift it until you tell me when it's here. Yeah, now that's in front of me. Well, I'm not gonna send you home with lenses clipped to your glasses. They're too expensive, too heavy. It just doesn't work. Instead, I know that straight edges 
give me the same effect. I use something called 3M transport tape. Here it is, okay? It's etched in one millimeter sections. It tears easily. Uh, you can measure it easily. It goes on the back of the lenses. It can be changed easily. A roll costs about $3, so it lasts a long time without much cost. You can grind prism into lenses, but lenses are expensive, and this is going to change a lot. So it's very easy for me just to change the tape, and, you know, and that's what I do. And my therapy for my patients is you just wear your glasses with this tape. You wear, you know, and we tape up all your glasses, your sunglasses, your reading glasses, your regular glasses. I want you to have tape in front of your eyes all the time. You still need to do your OT and your vision therapy. I just consider what I'm doing to be um, eliminating the visual roadblocks to the success of those therapies. Um, and you don't have to get to 100% normal to function again. I always ask my patients to grade themselves. They say, what percentage of your pre-injury self are you? And they'll start out when I first meet them, they'll say 30 or 40%. I tell them, if we can get you to 85%, you'll probably function just, you know, just fine, just, just perfectly. So in conclusion, um, if what I have said sounds like you or someone that you know, I would love to work with you. Um, you can find me on the web at litchfieldeyecenter.com or my main office number is area code 320-593-3100. And thank you, Amy, for putting together this forum and thank you for allowing me to participate. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. And please go ahead and drop your information in the chat so um, that anyone can have access to that when we're done. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, I, I share this statistic a lot, but it's something like 90% of brain injury survivors have an eye tracking problem. And that was definitely my biggest problem and nobody was catching it. And even the, the neurologist, I kept telling her something's wrong with my eyes. Nope, they're fine. And, um, you know, technically the acuity was fine, but they were not working properly. So thank you for what you do. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Victoria Day joining us from Missouri, Columbia, Missouri. And I met Victoria, was it just last month? I spoke to their online support group. And um, so I'm so glad that she reached out to me and then I invited her to be part of today's event. So thank you for being here. Time, time flies, time flies. Oh, and you have the same birthday as me. So happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> and this morning when I did my first, uh, I, I have an embodiment uh, exploration that I do by Zoom on Wednesday mornings. The person who showed up, I said, you know, so is there anything going on today that feels important? And she said, it's my birthday. So <laughs> that's, that's it's been important. It is. Day. It's a day. Right. You know, when I was a kid, I thought that would be, I sort of thought that would have been really exciting, right? Meeting people. So, yes, my name is Victoria Day, and I am from mid Missouri. And I'm a brain injury survivor, which is what I'm going to mostly talk about today, although I'm going to touch a little bit on how that's influenced the work I do in the world. Um, so about six weeks ago, Facebook shared with me a post from 11 years ago that, uh, that I paid attention to, because in this post, I was actually sort of making fun of the fact that my doctor was suggesting that I slow down. And... My feeling was, you know, I was a single mom, I worked full time, I was getting my master's in counseling, I was studying somatic movement therapy, I was in a relationship and everything else I had going on. But I was also meditating. I had started meditating because he was asking me to go slower. And so I really felt like he was being silly at, at, at telling me I still needed to slow down. Um, it was about two weeks after that, that I, uh, was 
crossing through, well, first I live in Missouri. So the week before we had had two and a half feet of snow. And then this weekend it was almost 70 degrees, which meant everywhere the snow and ice had cleared except the alley that I was walking through. And I will admit I was rushing. Um, I was on ice. I felt pretty confident, but I looked over and I saw a place that was clear and I jumped and it was black ice and, you know, that ended up on my head. And so, you know, the reality of the moment was I was going so fast. I hadn't, I didn't even have the time to consider that that was probably black ice. So my first takeaway today is that what being a brain injury, brain injury survivor has helped me learn both personally and professionally is that culturally we really are all moving way too fast. <sighs> we have an unhealthy love of persistently pushing ourselves pushing ourselves to do things quicker so we can get more stuff done. And as a brain injury survivor, I just simply could not do that. I lost that capacity. So I am just going to slow down right now and invite any of you out there watching this to just let your breath go. To know that we are often moving so fast that we don't recognize how much we're pushing ourselves beyond our, 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 our limit, our sensory systems limit, our limit to make choices for ourselves until we run into a crisis. So that's my first point. <sighs> Slowing down. So my second takeaway uh, is that as a brain injury survivor, I did what I thought I was supposed to do. My partner drove me to the emergency room where I told them what had happened. And as Amy just said, I felt like one eye was looking the wrong direction. I was had a headache, I was nauseous. And at the ER, they did their analysis, they did their evaluation, they gave me a CT scan and then they sent me home and I remember these words. You're going to feel bad for a couple of days. Just let yourself rest. And then the next day I woke up and I couldn't walk, not because I'd lost my ability to walk, but because my I was so nauseous. I had so much sensory overwhelm. I uh, had such vertigo that I had to like crawl to the bathroom to get to the bathroom went back to the emergency room where at that point they gave me medication. It tapped down the nausea, it tapped down the headache. And again, they said to me, you know, give yourself a couple days. You're going to feel bad for a couple days. You just need to rest and then you'll be fine. And I did that, but it didn't work. And I felt uh, a lot of shame about that. And I, uh, didn't realize until about nine months later when I finally had the capacity to sit and go through all the paperwork that in the paperwork there was this, these really wonderful instructions about what I needed to be aware of for post-concussive syndrome but the doctor the medical professionals that I was working with at the ER never shared that so that's my second takeaway is and it sounds like other people have been talking about this but if you go to a medical professional and they say, no, right, you'll be fine, or no, it doesn't sound right. It really is important for you to be able to keep advocating for yourself, to know that this is not normal, um, that there is something going on. And I was really fortunate that, ironically enough, I went to my OBGYN, and he was the one that said about three months in, something is not right. And he started helping me understand what had happened in the brain injury. So it might not be what the, the support that you expect, but keep asking, keep advocating. Um, you know, don't believe. 
If you are somebody who feels better after two days, yay. And if you're not, keep asking. Um, so the third part for me is that about that same time that I was really struggling, I couldn't go back to work full time. I wasn't driving because of the sensory overwhelm. I was having extreme anxiety and depression, extreme anxiety and depression. Um, the, one of the reasons I contacted my OG, OBGYN is that I started like feeling crazy. Um, I also was fortunate enough to run into somebody who worked at our local services for independent living, a, an independent living organization. And he's, he had, you know, he kind of said, how you doing? And I was explaining to him what was going on. And he said, you need to come to our brain injury support group. And so here's my third point. I said, but I don't really have a brain injury because I didn't lose consciousness. I didn't lose my ability to walk or talk. I was never hospitalized. And in my head, that meant that I wasn't a real brain injury survivor. And luckily he was like, no, 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 no. All brain injuries are injuries to the brain and that makes them serious. And so I went to this brain injury group. I said the same thing to them. I don't feel like I belong here. And they said, yes, you do. And the other thing that they did was they helped me realize that I was not crazy or no crazier than I might have been before I got my brain injury. Right? I mean, but there were things that just did that I thought like sane people don't have this experience. And they helped me normalize it. They helped me understand it. <clears throat> and so that that piece has come into my work now as a somatic movement therapist. I I never uh, doubt that what the person is telling me that they're experiencing isn't true for them. Like I know that that's true for them. I always invite them to slow down, go back to their breath, the very beginning. Right. I also always say whatever they're doing, like, let's find you a community. And for me, that's my final point is if you're a brain injury survivor and you're not part of a supportive brain injury group, I urge you to reach out. And that's my uh, final little piece is that I am the facilitator, the co-facilitator of the Columbia, Missouri based brain injury support group. And we are on Zoom, so we are open to whoever needs that support. You can find us on Facebook. I'll put that in the chat. Thank you so much, well, Amy. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad um, that we were able to connect with each other and um, have you here today. So yeah. just thank you so much for all that you do with, with leading your group um, and everything else that you do with your work. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, it's it's great to be part of a a collective a collective of support. Mm -hmm. All right, and next we have a commercial from Integrated Brain Centers. This time with Dr. Perry Maynard. Hey, there's Dr. Perry Maynard at Integrated Brain Centers in Denver, Colorado. Here at Integrated Brain Centers, we specialize in the treatment and management of patients suffering from post-concussive syndrome and mild traumatic brain injuries. With that comes a whole variety of different symptoms, everything from dizziness and vertigo to headaches, fatigue, mood disorders, and things like dysautonomia or POTS. These are patients that we see on a daily basis, and we have a variety of tools and practitioners here at our clinic that are able to help provide a wide variety of different therapies to help individuals get back to their goals and get back to living the life that they want to live. If you're interested to learn more about our clinic, please look us up at integratedbraincenters.com and there you can always set up a free consultation with myself or the other practitioner, Dr. Stedman, to learn a little bit more about our clinic and if we might be able to provide some help for you or a loved one. All right. And I am going to share my screen again. 
And I just want to give another big thank you to all of our sponsors for today. Our major sponsor, Integrated Brain Centers. Again, you can schedule a consultation with them at integratedbraincenters.com. And all of our other sponsors whose wonderful commercials you've seen throughout the day, Hope After Brain Injury, Mindful Dina Joy, Lighthouse, Self-Care Sanctuary, Broken Wings, Green Compass, Brooke Mills, Allo Holistic Wellness, and Simone Fortier. Just another reminder, you can connect with me on Instagram at Amy Zelmer on Instagram and Facebook. And you can get a free copy of our concussion discussions book that came out last March. Um, you just have to pay shipping and handling for $9.95, which is still half the price of purchasing it on Amazon. Um, we only have about 40 left. So if you're interested, you'll want to go grab that quickly. Um, and it's just an anthology. It's a collection of of uh, chapters written by doctors who work specifically with brain injury patients. And also grab a, uh, your free subscription to the Brain Health Magazine. This is such a great resource, you guys. Everybody should be subscribed to this. Um, you can get the digital version for free. You can also purchase a print subscription in the US um, if you prefer to have the actual printed magazine to read. You can join me weekly for my yoga classes for just $10 a month. Uh, you can go to my Patreon site to register and sign up for that. And you'll also have access to all of our past classes as well. And again, you can fill out our form for our doctor guide. And um, you'll have a consultation with either Dr. Perry or Dr. Shane, and they will either, you know, determine if you should come out to Colorado to work with them, or if they can find a functional neurologist near you, um, that would be a great fit for you and your symptoms. So go ahead and fill that out if you're interested. And the podcast series, you can subscribe on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Oops, I think I skipped one yet. And don't forget to join Amy's TBI Tribe, a private Facebook group. I think most of you are already in there, but if you're not, um, that's where you can connect with other survivors, caregivers, and loved ones. And you can also grab a not invisible care package with some buttons and wristbands just for $5 plus a dollar shipping and handling. All right. Why are you not stopping? There we go. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That wraps up our 2022 virtual brain injury awareness day event. Thank you all so much for coming. I know that the brain injury association also had an event going on this afternoon. So thank you for those of you who stuck around here. Um, we appreciate you and we will get a recording of this sent out tomorrow. Um, I will get the, the recording of this entire, um, awareness day event sent to you along with the links that everybody has put into the chat. Um, so I will get that sent out. Thank you everyone for all the little happy birthday messages here. I appreciate it. Um, and just really thank you all for being here. I hope that you have gotten some great information today and some inspiration and just thank you to all the speakers. You all have such words of wisdom, such great information for everyone. And, you know, everybody just give yourself a little pat on the back and acknowledge the fact that you are here today and, um, you know, taking care of yourself. You can consider this some self-care. Uh, so thank you all for the birthday wishes. Thank you all for being here and thank you. And we'll see you next year as well. So have a wonderful rest of your brain injury awareness month, which is March. And uh, don't forget to take part on National Concussion Awareness Day on September 16th. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.